And I call on Neil Finlay to speak to and to move the motion. President officer, it's a great honour to chair the Health and Sport Committee of this Parliament and open uh, this debate on the Committee's ongoing work on the preventative agenda. <coughs> Members uh, may be wondering where our report on the subject is. Um, the fact is that our inquiry is at a very early stage and we ask for this debate in order that all members could participate from the outset, outset and contribute towards uh, this piece of work. The Health and Sport Committee may be leading today, but this inquiry affects all members, most committees of the Parliament and every sector of government. It's a, this is a cross-cutting issue involving education, justice, transport, housing, the environment, social security, culture and many other areas of government. When I was appointed convener of the Health, uh, Health and Sport Committee, I made it clear I wanted to run a very democratic and open committee and one which listened to real people. Over the last nine months, we have worked directly with patients, staff, carers, health professionals, uh, and not just lobbyists, policy officers and the politically connected. At our business planning event, we agreed a strategic plan for the committee. Our plan uh, covers not only the current session, but one that takes a much, much longer view of health and care. The plan is short, concise and highly relevant to this debate. And its overriding aim is in all our actions to improve the health of the people of Scotland. Fundamental, fundamentally, that is what this debate is about. Improving the health of the people of Scotland. This is not matter, a matter solely for the Health Committee, nor for the Cabinet Secretary for Health, nor solely for health professionals. It concerns us, eh, all of us in whatever area we are operating, eh, operating in, as today's motion makes clear. Modern medicine is overwhelmingly reactive rather than proactive. You get sick, you seek medical assistance, and hopefully you're cured or made better. What is less common is the overarching community and national planning that focuses on prevention and early intervention. Prevention and early intervention is as much about housing, jobs, economic or environmental policy as it is about health and social care policy. The first paragraph of the government's health and social care delivery plan published in December makes that very point. But that plan relates entirely to health services. And perhaps I can gently say to the Cabinet Secretary for Health that this is a great pity, an opportunity missed to include other areas which between them hold the key to reducing demand on our health services while closing the inequality gap. Because health inequality is a manifestation of social and economic inequality and we will never tackle this from a health perspective alone. It has to be a whole government cross societal approach. A focus on prevention of course is not new, it goes back through time in various guises. The introduction of sanitation and clean water, slum clearance, Council housing and the NHS itself are some of the most successful examples. And I would suggest that makes the point that the state has a very important role to play. Uh, and witnesses we've heard from were quick to point to the effectiveness of measures that use fiscal, regulatory and legislative, legislative levers to reduce exposure to harm and address inequality. These levers impact upon the whole population rather than focusing on individual behaviours. <clears throat> Measures such as those covering the sale and distribution of tobacco and alcohol, taxation of these products and other restrictions introduced to restrict smoking in public space, uh, places are good examples. So we need a dual strategy of treatment, yes, but running alongside the active prevention. The Christie Commission on the Future Delivery of Public Services in 2011 did not believe there was a magic solution to the problem of resources currently being tied up in dealing with short-term problems to the exclusion of efforts to improve outcomes in the longer term. The Commission saw no alternative but to switch to a preventative action to avoid what they called demand failure, swamping the capacity of our public services to achieve outcomes. They noted it was imperative public services adopt a much more preventative approach and address a persistent problem of multiple negative outcomes and inequalities faced by far too many. In 2011, the Finance Committee of this Parliament identified that all public spending could be classified in some way as preventative. And they sought from the Scottish Government a robust and measurable definition of preventative spending to be used across the public uh, sector. 
It would be helpful if the Cabinet Secretary and her contribution could cover that aspect and assist the committee with a working definition. If we move forward to 2016 in the Audit Committee, uh, the Audit Scotland and Audit Scotland in their report, Changing Models of Health and Social Care, acknowledge what they call the ambitious vision that has been set by government, but noted as a key message that this, the shift to new models of care is not happening fast enough to meet growing need. New models in place being generally small scale and not widespread. Audit Scotland called for strong leadership, identification of measures of success, models of new investment and new ways of working. They called for a clear framework by the end of 2016 for how that vision is to be met. The Health and Social Care Delivery Plan was the government response with an aim to have high quality services that focus on prevention and early intervention. Prevention is mentioned frequently in the document as being the focus, eh, including a lifetime wide approach to prevention. But I say again, an opportunity is missed in the plan to link beyond the boundaries of health services. A central eh, part of meeting the vision is the national clinical strategy and realistic medicine. The problem we are having in committee and scrutinising prevention remains the same as was highlighted by the Finance Committee in 2011. That is to understand how the shift to prevention is to be defined, how it has been planned and how it has been funded and then how it can be measured. This takes me to the committee's work to date. In January we agreed uh, we needed to understand what we were dealing with, uh, what exactly is preventative spend and preventative expenditure. Spice told us that these terms are both vague and conceptual and that all public expenditure could be argued to be preventative. They warned us public services can, because of a lack of definition, uh, retrospectively fit their services under these headings. And they warned us it is difficult to uh, attribute outcomes to any one policy. We also uh, noted another Audit Scotland report, Changing Models of Care, which urged effort to address the gap and cost information and evidence the impact of new models. So we put out a call for views on the definitional question and how much spending could be identified and tracked. We also asked how spending could be shifted from reactive on acute services to preventative and primary services, and how could that shift be speeded up and incentivised. We received nearly 70 comprehensive and thoughtful responses. In March, we explored these issues further with a group of expert practitioners in the uh, public health field with integrated joint boards and eminent academics. They confirmed difficulties in definition and warned us about counterfactuals, uh, what would have happened anyway without interventions. We heard about false dichotomies when uh, considering the relative merits of addressing social determinants against more specific interventions. We were also told that shifting the balance of care does not mean the same thing as shifting resource. Community-based uh, care will not necessarily save money, even if all the work to shift the balance is successful. We were warned of the need to compress mortality to reduce the time people spend in ill health and keep people healthier for longer. Overall, however, most were saying the same thing to us. We need to have a whole system approach joined up government and a focus on reducing the shocking levels of health inequalities we see in Scotland today. Fundamentally, we all need to agree what actions on the ground are going to make a difference and how the existing barriers around using resources can be tackled. And I guess how we can measure the outcomes that are achieved, a sub subject on which I am absolutely sure my colleague Ivan McKee will cover in the debate. Um, Although the committee were also told that the necessary evidence, information and data is available, but we need to get better at measuring it from the outset, outset and interpreting, interpreting it and then using it. There is, however, a need to avoid the danger of paralysis by examination, modelling and testing. We heard from uh, Midlothian Integrated Joint Board about how they are undertaking uh, to better understand their communities and how they are using that to design new targeted holistic interventions that look at the social determinants of people's issues. They are measuring improvements or changes using gap indicators, which in effect are the measures being taken to close that gap. But this needs a long-term view. It's not always clear. And we, and we heard about the difficulty in making linkages between 
a single intervention and an impact, which may take us back to counterfactuals. President Officer, time is not sufficient for me to fully cover our inquiry. I've tried to give a flavour of what we in the Health and Sport Committee are looking to consider. Our next steps will be partly to be determined by what we hear today and what members say. Should we look at discrete initiatives and evaluate how successful or otherwise they have been and try to read across their outcomes into other areas? Or should we perhaps focus on how improvement, outcomes and benefits are both uh, are being evaluated? Could or should we do both? Returning to our strategic plan and its focus on health inequality, should we, uh, as a health committee, focus on health inequalities and measures to address these, but only through the prism of health interventions? I and the committee would really value your thoughts today. My one plea is that we all endeavour to take a longer-term view of this and resist the to, to uh, view the next, uh, the next election as the horizon Seems like we have an election every five minutes just now. <laughs> uh, as a committee, our strategic plan commits us to at least a 15-year view. President officer, in closing, we will only see meaningful progress with a concerted cross-government approach and an approach that is properly resourced. It's absolutely appropriate. This issue, this issue has been uh, discussed early in our work and only by joint and joined up action will progress be possible and taking a preventative approach and tackling the root causes of health inequality. Uh, I move the motion in the name of the Health and Sport Committee. Thank you. I now call on Shun Robinson, the Cabinet Secretary, to respond on behalf of the Government. Thank you very much. I want to welcome this debate initiated by the Health and Sport Committee, and I look forward to hearing today's debate and the committee's, uh, seeing the committee's final report. Uh, as Neil Finlay highlighted in his opening remarks, the inquiry by the Health and Sport Committee is building on the recommendations of the Christie Commission and the work of the Parliament's Finance Committee, which took evidence from the Cabinet Secretary on Finance on prevention in last session. Uh, Neil Finlay was right in saying that uh, the debate needs to uh, look beyond the confines of the NHS uh, and needs to be uh, cross-government in nature. It is a very broad topic and I'm going to try to focus my remarks on some strategic uh, priorities. I think a hallmark of Scotland, whether it's Parliament or, or indeed it's government, has been a willingness to innovate and try new ideas relevant uh, to this debate, our, uh, two examples come to mind. Firstly, our pursuit of alcohol minimum pricing and secondly, the introduction of the early years collaborative. Both are preventative measures that demonstrate our willingness to try new uh, and challenging ideas, but also highlight the complexity of understanding what we mean when we talk about prevention. Neil Finlay, in his opening remarks, asked for the, the Scottish Government's definition of preventative uh, spending and uh, uh, the Preventative approaches, of course, are, are many and diverse, and any definition needs to give us flexibility to address different challenges across a range of policy and delivery uh, contexts. We therefore believe that prevention should be defined in broad terms as activity which maintains positive outcomes and breaks cycles of negative outcomes, helping to tackle persistent inequalities for people and communities. Over the long term, these activities will reshape services and demand and contribute to the long term vitality of communities and the sustainability of public services. In this way, we look beyond preventative spending decisions alone to consider how to make best use of the totality of resource available, our people and other assets, as this will be the key to enabling a, a fully preventative public service uh, culture. Uh, High quality public services play a, a crucial role in shaping both our economy and society and play a, a role in primary prevention. Our ambitious programme of reform in Scotland with its emphasis on prevention, integration and empowerment provides the, the means to reshape services and demand in a way which contributes to the long term vitality of communities and the sustainability of public services. Building on the foundations established in the Christie Commission report, our approach to public service reform is underpinned by the principle principles of democracy and reform. We see prevention as the route to tackling the most difficult and entrenched problems that people in our communities uh, face and to achieving our goals of reducing inequalities and driving inclusive growth. We believe that collaborative partnership working across the, the public, private and third sectors can enable us to deal with this complexity in a more uh, joined up way and to make the best use of the total resource available to us. 
By focusing on outcomes, we aim to develop and deploy resources in a way that establishes a, a truly preventative culture, one which forges deeper relationships with local people and is more open and responsive to what communities most value. This was the premise in a second. This was the premise set out in the Christie Commission's report and is the vision uh, that we are continuing to progress towards building on the pillars of prevention, partnership, people and performance. Yeah. Alex Cole Hamilton. I'm very grateful for the Cabinet Secretary for giving way. I absolutely endorse her remarks about collaborative working across the third sector and the public sector in terms of reducing negative social outcomes in our community. But how does that marry up with a cut that represents nearly a quarter of the budget to alcohol and drug partnerships in our community? Cabinet well, Secretary. As I've just said, the focus uh, needs to be on outcomes, and the Scottish Government has already invested over £630 million to tackle problem alcohol and drug use since 2008. If you look at the outcomes for the last year, 2016-17, uh, those standards that have been set within the LDPs have been met. In fact, the, the three-week target for access to alcohol and drug treatment has actually exceeded the 90% target and is 94%. Uh, we need to focus more on the outcomes and what we will be working with shortly are to, um, to basically to set out indicative allocations and expectations in respect of ministerial priorities and outcomes that are to be achieved by boards and other partners. So what we will expect is not just the Scottish Government money but the resources in our health boards and our local authorities to be working together to make sure that they deliver on those priorities and importantly those outcomes. Um, we're making a, a significant investment uh, and structural reform with the aim of prevention. Again, I want to cite some examples. The Early Years Framework, the Children and Young People Improvement Collaborative is uh, crucially important. The Reducing Reoffending Change Fund, the Scottish Attainment Challenge, and of course, importantly, the integration of health and social care. And I want to draw on one or two of those to illustrate that work. The defining mission of this government is to deliver excellence and equity in education. We want to see the poverty-related attainment gap in Scotland close wherever, whenever and however it is measured. And that's why we've committed £750 million during the course of this parliament through the Attainment Scotland Fund, targeting resources at the children's schools and communities most in need. And through the Scottish Attainment Challenge, we want to break this cycle by improving literacy, numeracy and health and well-being, raising educational attainment and increasing positive destinations for our most disadvantaged children. This is a good example of primary prevention alongside, of course, the Fairer Scotland Action Plan, which sets out 50 concrete actions that will take over the course of this parliament to tackle uh, inequality. Uh, I want to, given my own portfolio interest specifically, to turn to, to one of the biggest structural changes that we have initiated in uh, uh, the, the very ambitious reform of health and social care services in Scotland, really since the creation of the NHS in 1948. And that's brought about a fundamental realignment of resources that will build the capacity and strengthen preventative action of our community-based services. It's clear that making a decisive shift towards prevention requires a fundamental change in the relationship between people and public services. Modern healthcare means embracing the public as partners, not as passive recipients. It's about uh, realistic medicine. And I think Christy got it right when he said that we have to consider our structural systems to ensure that they're better aligned to help deliver our preventative agenda. And with that in mind, I can't uh, uh, not mention that work underway with local government to agree a set of national public health priorities that will inform local, regional and national action. Our aim is for public health thinking to be embedded in all parts of the public sector. Our shared priorities will be those activities that have the greatest potential to make a significant improvement to health gain, uh, tackling inequalities and promoting inclusive growth over the next 10 years. Work has already started to develop these priorities and will be engaging widely over the spring and summer to build consensus and momentum ahead of publishing priorities at the end of the year. I think we can all agree that prevention has the potential to reduce demand for services arising from poor health. I hope we can also all agree that there are many aspects to a preventative approach that impact at different points in people's lives, sometimes at a population level, sometimes directly with individuals. I hope we can also agree that the prevention of poor health outcomes is not just a matter for the NHS and its professionals, but encompasses the activity 
of the whole of government and the whole of our public services and that if we get our public services better aligned, working more closely with the people they serve, we will make progress. But to do so, we also need to develop and promote a strong shared narrative and show continued collective leadership on this issue. Within the existing structures, we've seen real successes in tackling the burdens of preventable disease. Life expectancy and healthy life expectancy have both improved significantly in Scotland over the past decade. We need to take that on, and by shifting our focus to prevention, we can make a further difference to the lives of people living in Scotland. And I'm sure the committee, uh, Health and Sport Committee of this Parliament will help us in that endeavour. Thank you. And now call on Donald Cameron to open for the Conservative Party. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I'm delighted to open for the Scottish Conservatives on this Health and Sport Committee debate into preventative spending. For the obvi obvious reason, this debate raises issues which require urgent attention as we consider the health of Scotland's population and the consequences that has for our NHS, not just in the next five years, but the next 15 years, the next 25 years, even the next 50 years. The issue of preventative health was brought into sharp focus for me very early on as an MSP when I met two charities in the same day. Each charity dealt with uh, two wholly distinct health conditions. One was concerned with diabetes, uh, the other with liver disease. When asked about the solutions needed to make lasting inroads into these conditions, the same answer was given. We need to meet people to live a healthier and more active lifestyle. Now, we spend a lot of time talking about the state of our nation's health, and I personally participated in a variety of debates, both members' debates and, and general debates in this chamber where major health issues have been discussed at great length, but scarcely have issues surrounding the root causes of so many of Scotland's ills been laid bare, as well as how we in this parliament can focus resources on prevention rather than just treatment. There are a lot of varying opinions, of course, when it comes to Scotland's health. That's the nature of politics. But we must first be honest about the situation before we can act. It is clear that Scotland is in a desperate situation and we need to act now so that future generations will not suffer from the big health problems that we see today in such significant numbers. As the motion states, it is also clear that we need to bridge the gap between the wealthiest and the poorest in terms of health inequalities. And I'm delighted that as well as being on the Health and Sport Com Committee, I co-convene the CPG on health inequalities along with Anna Sawa and Claire Hockey. And I know there are a number of other MSPs who play an active role in, in that group where we discuss these issues with professionals uh, and interested parties. Scotland is highly unequal and has the widest mortality inequalities in Western Europe. The poorest Scots are three times more likely to commit suicide, more likely to die of cancer, more likely to suffer from a stroke, and more likely to die as a result of an alcohol-related condition than those in the most affluent parts of Scotland. Almost a third of our adult population are obese, costing our health service up to £600 million per year, and Scotland continues to have the worst weight outcomes of any of the UK nations and among the worst of any OECD nation. Around one in three children live with at least one binge drinking parent in Scotland. No one political party, professional or individual is to blame. This is a cross party and cross society issue and we must all be prepared to be honest about the state of Scotland's health. Only then can we move forward and tackle the challenges head on. We must also be mindful of the fact that with poor health outcomes, there are a range of social factors which feed into this, which we must consider. And uh, the motion uh, acknowledges that. Education inequality is a significant factor, with Scotland's poorest children on average 31 months behind children from wealthier backgrounds in sciences on reading, and on average 26 months behind in mathematics. Similarly, affluent pupils are more, four times more likely to attend university than deprived pupils. We can't expect to reduce the health inequality gap without closing the education attain attainment gap. And I acknowledge that the Cabinet Secretary for Health uh, mentioned that in, in her speech. Turning to the committee's work in this area, I would like to pay tribute to my fellow members on the committee and the committee clerks for all the work they have done, the initial work at least, in, in placing preventative health at the forefront of what the committee has done in its first year. I think we all recognise the importance of highlighting the radical action required if we are to avoid significant issues in terms of chronic conditions which may arise in the future unless focused preventative spending is undertaken now to deliver a more active and healthier population. 
I understand this is a complex area, given that the success of any prevention strategy is never really known for some time. And it does require time and input from all sides of this chamber and beyond so that we get it right. And when the Health and Sport Committee called for written submissions from organisations and individuals on the preventative agenda, it received 67 responses from a range of charities, governmental organisations and professionals who have detailed innumerable statistics and analysis about the poor state of Scotland's health. If I may, I'd like to concentrate on two areas where the committee has been active, in, in fact, even prior to the actual inquiry. Uh, the first was um, in undertaking a report on increasing participation in sport. Uh, some members of the committee visit, visited Avi Moore and King Usi in my own Highlands and Islands region to look at the work of High Life Highland and the role of community sports hubs in a rural setting. And it was hugely instructive to see on a community level the degree of engagement and coordination between a large variety of organisations from schools to rambling clubs who are coming together with the sole aim of achieving greater participation in sport, as well as the role of senior pupils in school providing leadership to younger pupils. Secondly, the committee sessions at the end of last year on obesity were very illuminating. One specific issue that was also covered in my members' debate in January was the link between obesity and cancer. As I noted in that debate, it is estimated that around four in every 10 cancer diagnoses are preventable. Cancer Research UK have noted that obesity is the single biggest cause of preventable cancer after smoking and is linked with 13 different types of cancer. And we know that around 10% of bowel, breast and womb cancers in the UK can be prevented by being physically active for at least 30 minutes a day for five days a week. I hope I provided a brief overview of the immense challenges that Scotland faces. And I know that my colleagues and others in this chamber will go into greater detail about specific areas of preventative health that we must explore. But in closing, I would observe that it's also incumbent on us to challenge established orthodoxies. Whilst we all accept the role of the preventative agenda and the principles behind it, we must be able to have a frank and candid discussion about where money is spent and how it is spent. There may be some programmes which we have supported in the past, but which we need to give up because other avenues would provide better results. And the committee's inquiry must be alive to radical and innovative thinking, given the scale of the challenge before the country. And I again note what the Cabinet Secretary said about being, um, uh, identifying new and challenging areas. There are a lot of people counting on us to explore this topic, to identify solutions and to implement change. And only with open discussion will that occur. And I'm delighted to offer the support of my party to the motion today and the ongoing work of the committee in this area. I now call on Colin Smith to open for the Labour Party. Thank you, President Officer. It's a, it's a privilege to open on behalf of Labour on an issue which I know is, is so important to all members of the Health and Sport Committee. When Labour created the NHS in 1948, life expectancy in Scotland was 64 years for men and 69 for women. Today, it's now around 77 for men and 81 for women. It shows the success of Britain's greatest achievement, our NHS. But we all know that for far too many Scots today, from the very moment they are born, simply because of where they are born, that life expectancy of 81 or even 77 is something they're unlikely to achieve. The very first paragraph of the previous Health and Sport Committee's report on health inequalities in 2015 summed it up when it chillingly read, a boy born today in Lenzi, Eastern Bartonshire, can expect to live until he is 82. Yet a boy born only eight miles away in Calton, in the east end of Glasgow, life expectancy may be as low as 54 years, a difference of 28 years, or almost half as long again in his whole life. And it's not only life expectancy. In the most deprived areas, males spend 22.7 years not in good health, compared to 11.9 years in the least deprived areas. These figures show that tackling health inequalities has to be at the very heart of any debate on preventative health. They are inextricably linked, and if you want to prevent ill health, you need to tackle health inequalities. And if you want to tackle health inequalities, you need to tackle inequalities in wealth, in education, in transport, and in housing. We know, for example, being in work and your income is fundamentally associated with your health. In Scotland today, we suffer from record levels of underemployment, job insecurity, zero hours contracts, and low pay. That means action on the real living wage, whether we show ambition in user tax powers, and how we manage our new social security system will all have a major impact on inequality and therefore on our health. 
Indeed, following the publication of the Scottish Public Health Observatory report in 2014, Dr Jerry McCartney, head of the observatory at NHS Health Scotland, said, whilst tax options may, seem to be directly, may not seem to be directly health-related, they will save lives and ultimately save the NHS precious money and resources. Interventions that redistribute income, such as increasing the standard rate of income tax or implementation of a living wage, are among the most effective interventions for reducing inequalities and improving health. It is clear that the solutions to health inequalities cannot simply be tucked away within policies on health and social care. As Neil Finlay has already highlighted, the Scottish Government's recently published Health and Social Care Delivery Plan disappointingly has little to say about tackling health inequalities. It fails to acknowledge the notion of health in all policies highlighted by a number of submissions so far to the Health and Sport Committee's inquiry. The importance of a cross-departmental approach to health was also highlighted by the Christie Commission when it published its report in 2011. It stressed the need for community planning partnerships to have an understanding that health inequalities are not purely a concern of our National Health Service. Christie called for the strengthening of democratic accountability, of a joined-up public sector leadership approach and giving public sector staff the freedom to develop approaches in accordance with local circumstances rather than a top-down approach. Now, the extent to which this has happened is debatable, given that the most significant reform we have seen in the management of public services in recent years was the establishment of centralised police and fire and rescue services. But the reality is, tackling health inequalities has to be put at the centre of all government policy development, for example, carrying out health inequality impact assessments for all policies and plans. All government departments and public services need to play a key role in reducing inequality, whether that is delivering accessible public transport, affordable sport and leisure facilities, decent, damp-free social housing or properly funded local services. There is a need to get serious about a more joined-up approach to the delivery of services and the pace of change needs to be increased. Now, in the short time I have, let me give just one brief but simple example, the co-location of money advisors in GP surgeries. We know that primary care is the access point for the majority of people in the NHS, but not everyone needs to see a GP. Having additional services in GP surgeries helps take pressure off our already overstretched GPs. With £2 billion worth of benefits unclaimed in Scotland and the cost of co-locating a money advice specialist in a GP surgery just £11,500, with an estimated return on investment of £39 for every £1 spent, this is exactly the type of practical measure that recognises the clear link between inequality, poverty and health. Crucially, as is clear in the evidence so far to the committee, there is also a need for a relentless focus on the early years from pre-birth onwards. Stimulating learning in very young children and preparing them for primary school is essential to help break the cycle of health inequality. Now, while tackling health inequality and therefore preventative health is a cross-cutting issue, there is still very much a role directly for health and social care. In public health, we know that Scotland faces an obesity crisis, with two-thirds of adults and almost a third of children classed as overweight or obese. The current obesity framework is not working, and if the Government, when refreshing that strategy, propose a bolder, more radical replacement, which includes tougher regulation on the current promotion of unhealthy food over the healthy option, they will get Labour's backing. There is also a need for a revised and tougher tobacco strategy, setting out the priority actions and clear targets along the way to measure progress towards the Government's ultimate welcome aim of smoking prevalence below 5 per cent by 2034. And with Scotland continuing to have the highest level of alcohol consumption and harm in the UK, the need for a new alcohol strategy is also clear. In all these areas, obesity, smoking, alcohol-related harm, there are inequalities with people living in the most deprived areas most likely to be affected. And ultimately, with any strategy, it is the implementation and resourcing of that strategy that will be crucial, which is why the issue highlighted by Alex Cole Hamilton, namely the recent decision by the government to reduce funding for alcohol and drug prevention, is one that is deeply regrettable. We need to have an honest debate about how we resource our NHS. We all accept that we have an ageing population and more people with more complex needs. But despite this, despite this growing demand for services, local health boards are being hit by significant health savings of a billion pounds over the next four years. Those savings come at a time when the NHS is also struggling to recruit and retain staff, a problem that is exasperated by the number of unfilled trainee and specialist posts. One in four of our GP practices report a vacancy. There are 350 
consultant vacancies and more than 2,500 nursing and midwifery vacancies, including more than 300 unfilled mental health nurse posts. If we don't stop these cuts and have sufficient staff, it will make it all the more challenging for health boards and integrated joint boards to shift the balance of resources from reactive to preventative spend and to better focus resources and priorities on health inequalities. This Parliament has the powers to stop those cuts, to make different choices, to be progressive, to say that if we want decent health and social care, we need to ensure that we fund them properly. And that means being honest with the public and saying that those with the broadest shoulders should pay that bit more. Thank you. Thank you. We now move to the open debate. And I would suggest to members who have plenty of time to take and make interventions. I call Emma Harper to be followed by Brian Whittle. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. <clears throat> Before I begin, I would like to remind Chamber of my interests. I am a registered nurse and I am co-convener of the Lung Health Cross Party Group and I participate in other cross party groups that are health related as well. I too recognise the importance of the work that the Health and Sport Committee in its inquiry into the preventative health agenda is undertaken and I thank the convener and members and the clerks for their hard work. The local health delivery plan guidance says the nature and scale of the challenges that our NHS faces, in particular the challenges of an ageing population and the challenges of dealing with health inequalities, mean that we need to change the way that our NHS delivers care. The plans recognise that we must prioritise the actions which have the greatest impact on the service delivery and focus on three areas often referred to as the triple aim – better care, better health, better value. The Christie Commission estimated that 40% of all health spending was spent on interventions that could have been prevented. And the Commission insisted that focusing resources on prevention measures must be a key objective. Obesity, diabetes, coronary heart disease, stroke, cancer, mental health, dementia and alcohol-related diseases are major issues affecting people in Scotland and more so in lower socio-economic areas. We are already seeing a reduction in the mortality for the big three, cancer or non-respiratory cancer, coronary heart disease and stroke, due to the targeted multidisciplinary teamwork that has been implemented across Scotland. In the Chief Medical Officer's annual report, Realising Realistic Medicine, it showed between 1994 and 2015 there was a 36% reduction of all causes of premature mortality. There is a graph on page 48 clearly showing this mortality reduction for the big three. NHS boards and teams of professionals working together have been able to achieve this. Today, I'd like to focus on Scotland's lung health. It has been 10 years since the ban on smoking came into force on March 20, 2006. And banning smoking in cars with children as passengers is a move commended recently by health professionals across Scotland and my former colleagues in the respiratory team at NHS Dumfries and Galloway. But the number of deaths attributed to respiratory disease has flatlined and there has been little change over the last 20 years. The reason for the fall in mortality in other groups is due to a concerted effort with government support to target the big three in Scotland. At the Lung Cross Party Group, I have the privilege of meeting specialist doctors and other multidisciplinary professionals that have the prime directive of improving the lung health in Scotland. Representatives from the British Lung Foundation, Chest Heart Stroke Scotland and Asthma UK also attend. The BLF published the Battle for Breath. This document looks at lung health across the UK. And the big picture is that the UK lung disease mortality is among the highest in Europe. The overall cost for lung health in the UK is £11 billion a year. It's £1 billion in Scotland. The BLF paper makes recommendations for similar investment and attention that cancer and cardiovascular disease have had. Across Scotland, there are wide variations in the care given to people with lung conditions like asthma, lung cancer, COPD, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, mesothelioma and more. However, there is great work already being done. Action is already in place to prevent unscheduled hospital admissions, which contribute significantly to higher costs of overall care. 
Patients are taught to self-monitor their vital signs and use a scoring system that triggers action based on the severity of the score. Patients recognise the symptoms of exacerbation of their lung condition and then they can act like by getting an antibiotic prescription instead of a hospital admission. NHS Lothian have a light touch telehealth person centred approach to prevent or reduce unscheduled admissions and NHS and Friesen Galloway's multidisciplinary team are testing a community respiratory early warning score or cruise score currently. Fewer exacerbations lead to fewer admissions and leads to a reduction in costs. But more could be done. Mm. We have a national respiratory advisory group, the NAG group. It's chaired by Dr Ian Small. And they're working on a respiratory quality health improvement plan with the intent to it being delivered across Scotland. The current document is being created and is based on the Welsh and Northern Irish respiratory improvement plans. I'd like to suggest that the respiratory experts need government support to implement a national respiratory quality improvement plan or an RQIP. A strategy with some Scottish government assistance with coordination and support so that the deaths from lung disease can be reduced and hospital admissions can even be reduced. Presiding officer, this is what I'd like to ask mm -hmm. the Scottish government for to consider supporting the Respiratory Advisory Group to create a short life working group or a task force to, number one, agree on a national RQIP and then, number two, help roll it out. I'd like to call on the Scottish Government to consider supporting the next steps for healthier lungs for those affected in Scotland. The work of the Scottish Group would not be an uphill battle. The template has been created already and the battle for breath has already begun. So thank you. Thank you. I have Brian Whittle to be followed by Bob Doris. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. And can I start by thanking the Health and Support Committee for its work to date on the issue of preventable health agenda and bringing it to the Chamber to debate and discuss. As most of the Chamber will be aware, it's a subject that I have a particular passion for. And in the short time I have, I would like to focus on the relationship between physical activity food and nutrition and how they can contribute to the preventable health agenda, especially when early intervention is possible. It's widely acknowledged that having a healthy diet and an active lifestyle will certainly stack the cards in your favour when it comes to preventing many conditions like cardiovascular disease, stroke, type 2 diabetes, degenerative musculoskeletal issues, certain cancers, heart disease, uh, among others. We must also include uh, poor mental health as a condition that can be prevented in many cases by an active, healthy and inclusive lifestyle and is certainly useful in many cases in the treatment of mental health issues. Sam H has stated that prevention and treatment of poor mental health should include inclusivity and physical activity. In fact, so sure are they of this that they are helping to fund the Jog Scotland programme. The fact that a general lack of physical activity and poor diet is leading to an obesity epidemic with many above, above conditions increasingly appearing as comorbidity problems disproportionately so in the more challenging areas. Access to opportunity is certainly a main area we need to explore and, the, and to ensure that opportunity to participate is available to all irrespective of background or personal circumstance. And incidentally, we must also understand the differences between physical education, activity and sport. All are intrinsically linked, all are crucial, but all are very different. Getting active as early as possible should be the goal. With the advent of 30 hours of free, child, uh, free school childcare, uh, we have the opportunity to use those hours constructively in an active play framework. As I've said many times, the physical and mental pathways for life are mostly set at the preschool age, so a focus should be on this age group. Having an active, healthy lifestyle in the early years is likely to set the foundation for an active, healthy lifestyle for the rest of their lives. Following on, we need to ensure that when children reach primary school, the active framework continues into active games and on into activity and sport by secondary school. Access is the key, tackling barriers to participation to give opportunity for all. One of the solutions is surely to keep schools open after 4 p.m. If children need to go home from school and then go somewhere else, the drop-off rate will be high. While they're in school, they are a captive audience and with the right opportunity and encouragement, the physical activity uptake will be more likely to increase. 
A Child Poverty Scotland report suggested that some children from families with more challenging circumstances are saying they are not interested in participating in sport and activity, rather than asking their parents if they can take part, knowing they are likely to be told that they can't. Surely by opening up extracurricular activities at school, that barrier can begin to be addressed. The other issue in terms of participation I would like to raise is that of having enough appropriate teachers and coaches to ensure access to opportunity. This is borne out with the increasing waiting lists at clubs in many sports. There are solutions out there, however. Perhaps we should be looking at that section of the population that has life and work experience aplenty, those approaching retirement and already retired. When I was the manager of the Glasgow Athletics Development Scheme, we had 43 coaches on a rota working with school children who came from all over Glasgow to the Kelvin Hall, and all of those coaches were retired. Intergenerational social interaction, purpose and activity, quite a few boxes ticked here. There are always options worth exploring. Poor diet is an area that the Scottish Government has a direct input into from nursery education right through to primary and secondary schools, in our hospitals, or even our prison service. When doing some invest investigation into public food procurement policy through the Scottish Government Excel contract, I discovered that a sizable proportion of food that can be produced by our farmers is in fact sourced from outside Scotland and the UK, and much of it at reduced quality from that that's locally produced. And I welcome the Deputy Minister's decision to investigate in the nutritional quality of food served in schools as a result of this report. However, I would also encourage the Health Secretary and the Justice Secretary to do the same for hospital food and food served in prisons. By ensuring that the highest quality food sourced locally is available from nursery education onwards, the Scottish Government can have a significant impact on diet, especially in the earliest years. I'll take it. Neil Finlay. In relation to uh, his contribution, um, what we're, we're looking here and we're debating about is, is a whole government approach, a whole societal approach to uh, improving health and particularly those of uh, children. Um, how then does, for example, um, the government's, the UK government's social security policy contribute to that? I think Ryan Mr. Whittle. I think what Mr Finlay is alluding to is, is the inequality of income. Uh, and that actually has, that actually has got, uh, an, obviously has a bearing I think also what we have to also acknowledge is there is, there is a, um, the cost of participation as well as, well as, as, as an impact. And I think we've got to be really careful here because they're both, both intrinsically linked. And although I, I do, I do I recognise Mr. Finlay, uh, Mr. Finlay's uh, desire to really tackle this issue, uh, and I've been in, in, in the committees with him when he said this, I do actually think that you have a, a, an answer you're trying to get to and you're trying to find a question that will get you there. And I think what we have to have is a much more open mind. It's a much more open mind into a much, it's a much wider, uh, as has been stated in the, the chamber already, it's a very wide issue. Uh, by ensuring that the, the highest quality food sourced locally is available from nursery education onwards, the Scottish Government can have a significant impact on diet, especially in the earliest years where intervention will have the greatest long-term impact. It's also important to note that the good nutrition plays in mental health as well as physical health. According to the report by the Mental Health Foundation, Food for Thought, and I quote, nutrition is a factor for mental health in the same way it is for physical health and plays an important role in prevention, development and management of diagnosed mental health problems, including depression, anxiety, ADHD, and dementia. In establishing the activity levels of Scotland and the potential impact of top level sport and increased participation levels, it is important to note that within these figures, the increased waiting lists for sports clubs are not included, nor the people who are inactive who would like to be active but don't know, don't know how to or have the means to do so. Now, I ask, don't throw the baby out with the bathwater here. It's crucial that we recognise that investment in physical education, physical activity and sport at all levels is crucial if we are going to seriously tackle health inequality. The truth of the matter, Deputy Presiding Officer, is that preventable health agenda is primarily an educational intervention, not a health portfolio intervention. And can I once again thank the Health and Support Committee for giving us the opportunity to debate this in the Chamber. Thank you. I call Bob Doris to be followed by Monica Lennon. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer. I'm delighted to speak uh, in this afternoon's debate and can I commend the Health and Sport Committee and a constructive and proactive approach to its inquiry. 
As a previous deputy convener uh, of the last session's Health and Sport Committee, and with Labour's Duncan McNeill as convener at that time, I certainly know he'd be pleased at the approach the current committee is taking, and I have a strong interest in this area as well. As I tend to do in these situations, uh, President Officer, I, I want to talk about how, by getting such cross-party, cross-parliament support, we can really drive change. In the last Health and Sport Committee, we got significant change in relation to access to new medicines and medicines for rare conditions and regulation for care for older people. We achieved that by coming together, not in a tribal way, but in a cross-party, constructive and proactive way, and we drove real achievement there. Sometimes you get that cross-party approach in committees, but not always in this chamber. So it's good to see it transfer over to this chamber from time to time. Uh, I now have the privilege of convening the Local Government and Communities Committee in this Parliament. And housing is a huge part of our committee's remit. And I'm pleased housing is contained within the terms of the motion before us this afternoon. Housing has a key role to play in preventative spend. Health and social care integration is a significant step forward, as we've already heard, in the journey for joining up services locally. And in Glasgow, for instance, there's been a significant progress made in tackling delayed discharge from hospital. However, pressures do still exist, presiding officer, as does additional progress needed in supporting vulnerable residents in their own homes or in the most appropriate homely setting. I should, of course, commend Glasgow on including housing within its integrated joint boards. That's a real positive step, and it's the right thing to do. And I'd be keen to know how many integrated joint boards across Scotland have included housing and what consideration the government would give at some point in the future to making that a statutory requirement of success would start to be evidence-based in relation to that. I'd like to outline some of the issues with regards to housing in my constituency within Maryhill and Springburn. It can be difficult to find an appropriate housing and care solution for many individuals and, and families in my constituency, particularly actually sometimes when an older person is in failing health and they own their own home. Uh, my constituency is a number of low-income homeowners, often elderly, but, but I have to say not always, whose health is failing and they need suitable adaptions at their home or they need alternative accommodation. Let me give you some examples in, in, in relation to that. An elderly lady that uh, I'm working with is seeking to get a housing association to buy back her property. It's on the second floor and without a ground floor property, she'll be isolated and she'll be housebound. We have to ensure that social work services are rather health and social care board works collegiately with a housing association to make that happen and make sure the financial models that underpin that both suits the care, care at home services that that person needs and that it's seamless because that individual can't sell the property and not an appropriate place to go to. There has to be a seamless integrated support for that elderly individual. And another elderly constituent of mine who is also a homeowner is unable to return home at present. The property would require significant adaptions um, and the best outcome might even be an extension to that property. That puts huge challenges on budgets, of course it does, and it puts huge challenges on how adaptions criteria at a local authority level can, can meet that. Do we need new funding models to, to make that happen? There's equity in properties there. Do we have to think more carefully about how we get a joined up process and a joined up system so there are opportunities there if we think proactively and out of the box and how we can take some of these things forward. So I'm trying to give a flavour of how I hope the Local Government Committee perhaps it may seek to work in partnership with the Health and Sport Committee in relation to some early intervention work. Uh, because as we know, uh, if a person stays at home with the appropriate support for longer, they're not only happier and healthier, they need a slimmer care package and the actual the cost of the public purse in the long term is reduced. Everyone can be a winner in that situation. It's getting the model right to make it happen. Can I just say a little bit more about um, some of the debate around preventative spend? Quite often we get into a statistics war in relation to more money being spent in the community in terms of uh, the acute sector. Uh, and I think actually the Scottish Government has accounted for some of its spend uh, unwisely. I think the, the, the acute elective surgical centres that are going to be opening up across Scotland uh, puts money of investment in the column of acute services, showing uh, that we're going in the wrong direction, where we'll want to see more money put into community services. But I can't think 
of a more appropriate preventative spend than giving people the hip operations, the knee operations, the cataracts operations they need to stay in their own home. If they don't get these quickly and timiously, the slips, trips and falls is a huge issue. So by that investment the Scottish Government is making, it's actually making the situation look worse than it really is. This is a positive preventative spend investment and I don't think we account for it properly. Uh, Maybe see another thing that comes up when we looked at this in the last committee quite a lot, and that's in relation to the inverse care law, comes up quite a lot. And that tends to be an argument to move away from universal services to target those living in poverty. I think it would be unwise to move away from universal services. In the last committee, I was convinced that you must be wed to universal services, but look at an additional uptake drive for the areas, so that it's not just the worried well and more... Uh, income well-off areas that are making use of these universal services, but we ta we do I have time, President Officer? Yes, of course. Neil Finlay. Uh, Mr Doris will be familiar with the principle of proportionate universalism, where there's a universal service, but the areas who need it most get more. Does he not agree with that uh, principle? Bob Doris. Uh, uh, thank Mr Finlay for that intervention. I think that's the direction the government's hoping to move in. We have to put the financial models in place to, to underpin that. And I was going to go in and look at the, the GP's practices that are within the deep end uh, uh, areas, many of them in, in my constituency. Uh, to a degree, very well resourced, but if someone's going in there with multi-morbidities with five, six, seven things wrong with them, that 10-minute or 15-minute appointment, you don't get enough to enough opportunity to get the support you need compared to someone going into a, a GP surgery in an area with one health condition or for a preventative uh, health measure that they're seeking support of. Final thing I want to say, presiding officer, if I do have a little bit of time in hand, and that is you can do health to, me, to people as much as you like, but what we have to do is empower people to make positive choices in their lives. And that links into the Scottish Government's Community Empowerment Agenda, and it links into proper local regeneration initiatives. And it's only that I should name check in my constituency, Royston, a deprived community where the local authority was doing no regeneration, but they did their own. They got their own regeneration plan, and they now have take, take, take um, land which was wasting away back to be redeveloped for the community and they've got money for a local community centre. But it was the community's priorities, not the council's priorities. And in Springburn, there's an eyesore called the Talisman Pub. What's that got to do with preventative spend? Well, that pub has been sitting there withering away for generations now. If the community saw that demolished and something happened to that land, they might just buy in a little bit more to community regeneration. And you have to get that right for everything else to be right as well. It's about community empowerment, not just doing health to people, but asking people what they want for their communities. That will make a huge difference as well. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. We do still have some time in hand. Monica Lennon, followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'd also like to echo colleagues in commending the Health and Sport Committee for its inquiry into the preventative health agenda. In my role as an equality spokesperson for Scottish Labour, so much of the work that I've been engaged in since being elected last year has been focusing on highlighting the causes and solutions to complex health inequalities. And whenever we're talking in this place about health inequality or how we can address Scotland's ill health problems in the long term, the conversation always seems to circle back to preventative spend and action. Dealing with health problems after they've already occurred is much more difficult and costly to us as a society than it would be if we had taken preventative action to stop preventable health issues from arising in the first place. We know this, but we also know that the prescription for preventative health care is not as simple as it sounds or as politicians would like it to be. Preventing health inequality, which is so often ingrained in the first days of life, requires cross-cutting action across government, right across housing, education, the environment and more. There is certainly no one easy fix, but that's why it's welcome that the committee has taken the time to conduct its inquiry and to build on the work of the Christie Commission from previous sessions. In taking forward the findings of this inquiry, I welcome the focus on the cross-cutting nature of preventative action and welcome the BMA suggestion of a health and all policies approach. Such a policy is certainly an intriguing idea and further investigation by the committee of how this could be achieved would, in my view, be very worthwhile. 
In the time I have today, there are two particular aspects to the preventive health agenda I'd like to draw attention to. Having mentioned in my opening remarks about the importance of cross-cutting intervention, an issue that I've uh, consistently been raising over the past few months requires exactly that. The question of how do we improve the mental health of people in Scotland and how can we achieve this in a meaningful cross-portfolio way? Tackling Scotland's mental health problems needs urgent investment in the early years and adolescent support because failure to intervene at that crucial developmental stage only leads to storing up further problems later in life. And we know that half of all mental health problems start before the age of 15. And we know that there's a current crisis in waiting times for CAMS, with over 300 children waiting more than a year to be seen last year, and thousands more waiting for months upon months for help. And even then, we know that several hundreds of these children are being rejected for treatment, <coughs> with no further explanation or clear pathway to alternative support. More children coming forward for help with mental health struggles might well be a welcome sign that stigma surrounding mental health is reducing. But it's also a sign that investment to make sure those who require medical help can receive it must also be coupled with preventative action to provide support for those whom CAMS is not always necessarily the most appropriate destination. That's why Bernardo Scotland recently backed Scottish Labour's plan for an independent review of rejected referrals. It's welcome that the Scottish Government have indicated a commitment to an audit of referrals in the mental health strategy. But I was also disappointed, alongside a number of mental health charities, including the NSPCC and SAMH, by the lack of ambition and lack of detail on funding and timescales in the strategy when it comes to other preventative action. Most notably, that there is still no concrete commitment from the government to back the plan for school-based counselling. Having a qualified counsellor in every school would be a welcome step that the government is cognisant to the importance of prevention. It would be a clear, targeted action to improve the well-being of our children at the early stages and could be a crucial link in spotting and preventing mental health problems in their early stages by providing support to young people quickly at the right time and in their own environment. That's why I've been consistently pressing the government for further detail on how the dedicated, men or, uh, on how the dedicated mental health minister is working with the education secretary. But despite some reassuring and welcome words, the fact remains that the lack of action in the 10-year mental health strategy is disappointing. This type of preventative cross-cutting action is the bold vision required to transform Scotland's mental health services. Early prevention work like that is vital to reducing the harm of poor mental health, which in turn could have a transformative effect on reduce, reducing the pressure which mental health problems can have on other public services. And that brings me to the second aspect of the preventative health agenda, which I hope to draw attention to, the impact of alcohol harm and how we can reduce that also. The Scottish Government um, has pledged to bring forward another strategy on this later this year. And I agree with the view of Alcohol Focus Scotland that this presents a unique and excellent opportunity to set out the actions we need to reduce alcohol harm in Scotland. And I hope to see the Scottish Government commit to some bold preventative action, including a commitment to tackling marketing of alcohol to children and licensing regulations to reduce the availability. The effects of alcohol harm are most acutely felt in the most deprived communities, with those living in the poorest areas up to five times more likely to suffer an alcohol-related death than those in the least deprived areas. Given that the funding for alcohol and drug partnerships, which others have mentioned today, has reduced by 22% in the last financial year, a cut that's being maintained in the current budget. I think it would be a welcome move for the committee to investigate the impact of preventive spending to reduce alcohol harm more widely, which given the, and the cost of alcohol harm across many portfolio areas would, would have a very significant impact. In closing, presiding officer, driving forward the preventative health agenda will be crucial to the development of health policy during the lifetime of this Parliament. And the Health and Sport Committee's work on this topic so far is promising. I look forward to seeing them take up further investigation on preventative spending.
Uh, Alison Johnson to be followed by Marie Todd. Um, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm glad to contribute to this debate and reflect on evidence the committee has heard so far as part of our inquiry on the preventative health agenda. It's a timely inquiry which questions our public health spending priorities and challenges assumptions about shifting the balance of care. I'd like to thank all of those who've submitted evidence to inform the, the inquiry and provided briefings in advance of this debate. Um, and I'd like to thank our clerks and researchers too for their ongoing support. The committee's motion rightly stresses the cross-cutting nature of health inequalities. We need a decisive focus on health from a range of portfolios, including housing, education and the environment. We need to tackle serious systemic threats to public health like air pollution, it causes as many deaths as lack of physical activity. Research led by Professor David Newby at the University of Edinburgh and British Heart Foundation, just a couple of miles away from here at the Royal Infirmary, has demonstrated that particulate matter from traffic has a serious impact on our cardiovascular health. Urban air pollution prevents, presents a serious risk to young children, to pregnant women. It's been linked to premature birth, decreased lung function, and even neurological disorders. Now, the House of Commons will lead an unprecedented joint inquiry on air quality, including the Environmental Audit Committee, the Environmental Food and Rural Affairs Committee, the Health and the Transport Committees. And I'd really like to see equivalent joined up action here in Scotland. Friends of the Earth show that air pollution causes over 2,500 early deaths in Scotland every year, but I don't believe the matter is taken seriously enough. My colleague Mark Ruskell will soon be putting forward his bill to change the default speed limit, which will be a great step forward. But, presiding officer, I'd like to emphasise in this debate the fundamental importance of income and the impact that poverty has on health and well-being, because we won't make real progress in tackling health inequalities until we take real steps to reduce inequality of income and wealth. NHS Health Scotland has laid out clear evidence that inequality damages our health and recommends introducing a minimum income for healthy living, more progressive taxation and building a more vibrant democracy. These are all Scottish green values and we believe that preventative approaches to healthcare don't simply mean providing some services at a slightly earlier stage of illness, but fundamentally rebalancing our approach to public health. The State of Child Health report published by the Royal College of Paediatrics and Child Health shows we need a transformation in our approach to child health. There's a particularly urgent need to tackle child poverty because of the lifelong effect that growing up in poverty can have on health and well-being. The Social Security Committee, in which I also sit, has heard how the, wealth, the Healthier Wealthier Children Income Maximisation Programme developed in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde raised over £13 million over the last seven years for families in poverty and it increased the uptake of Healthy Start vouchers too. And I'm glad the Cabinet Secretary has agreed to roll out this approach across Scotland. The Child Poverty Action Group has welcomed this and they would welcome further details about how the extension will be implemented and funding. And I believe the Scottish Government's proposed reforms to maternity services, including individualised antenatal care for all women, presents an ideal opportunity to embed income maximisation across all maternity services. And a clear commitment to this must appear in any delivery plan leading from the Child Poverty Bill. I also believe this is the right time for a right to income maximisation services to be put on a statutory footing. Now, these actions are crucial because, sadly, child poverty throughout the UK is predicted to rise. The UK government's decision to scrap child poverty targets was shameful and limiting tax credits to families' first two children is wrong. It beggars belief that women are expected to prove they've been raped to receive tax credits for other children. And I, I can't begin to understand why anyone would ever think it's acceptable to put a form like this in front of anyone. And it is shameful that the Conservatives support it. Policies like this are hugely damaging to physical and mental health. We want to provide more support for financially vulnerable families, not less. And that's why the Scottish Greens have been calling for a £5 child benefit top-up, which the Child Poverty Action Group also recommended. We need to strengthen our focus on tackling health inequalities and child poverty in particular. 
And I do have concerns that are being lost in our debates about preventative spending and shifting the balance of care. The Scottish Government's health and social care delivery plan only mentions the phrase health inequalities twice and doesn't use the words poverty or income at all. Improving access to primary care and addressing unmet need should be absolutely key to health and social care integration, but there is a lack of clarity about the Government's plans for primary care. We know that the Scottish allocation formula has been reviewed, but the Commission's analysis hasn't been published and a further review of GP paying expenses is underway, but details aren't available for public scrutiny. The Scottish Greens have stressed the need to ensure fairer funding for GPs and primary care specialists working in areas of high deprivation. There's a case for adjusting the Scottish allocation formula in a way that ensures practices in deprived areas are properly resourced and ring fencing some funds delivered through the formula for patient care and practice development. The need to strengthen primary care in areas of high deprivation has been recognised for a long time, but progress to achieve this has been slow. The CARE report stated that resources should be selectively targeted to deprived areas to ensure that patients in these areas have enhanced opportunities to be seen and have their problems dealt with at an early stage. It's time for the government to provide clear information about its plans to improve primary care in areas of multiple deprivation beyond link workers. They are warm, warmly welcomed, as are the, the welfare rights advisors who are working in some practices. It is absolutely crucial, presiding officer, that our health services are equipped to meet the needs of an ageing population, but we mustn't lose a broader focus on families and child health. Thank you. Marie Todd, followed by Jeremy Balfour. Thank you, presiding officer. It's a pleasure to participate in this debate today as a member of the Health and Sport Committee. And can I take the opportunity to remind everyone that I'm a pharmacist registered with the General Pharmaceutical Council. Part of the challenge we have, as others alluded to in debating this issue, is that there's no single definition of what the preventative health agenda is. There's general consensus, though, that the preventative agenda is inextricably linked to the health inequalities one. But there remains a stubborn tension between the need to tackle issues and problems that face health and social care in the present and the view that the focus of preventative spend should be on the root causes of health inequality, the upstream socioeconomic factors, mainly the uneven distribution of wealth. Some of the most potentially significant public health interventions that government and health services can make might take decades to produce measurable financial outcomes. For example, the measures that successfully reduce the levels of overweight and obesity in children, which we all care so passionately about, and young adults, might, lead to, might not lead to financial savings to health services until those children reach middle to older age, when weight-related health complications would otherwise be more likely to occur. And where improved health outcomes are identifiable, it can also be very difficult to attribute particular outcomes to specific public health policies. For example, a variety of policies have been introduced to try to reduce tobacco consumption, but this multi-stranded approach can make it very difficult to attribute success to any particular policy intervention. This makes measuring the cost effectiveness and efficacy of individual approaches a challenge. And it's a real challenge for those of us whose job it is to scrutinize government spend. Um, a number of the submissions to our inquiry highlighted the false dichotomy between reactive spend and preventative spend. And I want to explore that a little bit with regard to my own profession. There are lots and lots of statistics published which illustrate the near need for a more preventative approach to pharmaceutical care and the scope for improvement. Over half of the medicines which are prescribed are not taken as the prescriber intended. More than one in four hospital admissions for older people are related to medication and considered preventable. If we look at asthma, according to Asthma UK, there were 1,143 deaths from asthma in the UK in 2010. Approximately 75% of the hospital admissions and 90% of the deaths which then occurred were preventable. Non-adherence to routine medicines has been estimated to cause approximately 48% of asthma deaths. Would more investment in pharmaceutical care here help? Certainly, I hope it's clear that the better treatment of illness can be considered preventative spend. 
This illustrates the notion that preventative health agenda is not clear cut, nor is it an area where there's universal agreement about approach. In Scotland, we've been really bold at times, and a recent example I want to take the opportunity to welcome in the Chamber today is the approval of PrEP. Scotland's become the first part of the UK to approve a drug which reduces the chance of HIV infection. The daily pill known as PrEP has been approved for use in the Scottish NHS by the Scotland's Medicines Consortium, the SMC, and it reduces the risk of getting HIV from sex by more than 90%. Among people who inject drugs, it reduces the risk by more than 70%. As Robert Mackay, the National Director for the Terence Higgins Trust Scotland said, not only will this make a life-changing difference to individuals by protecting them from a lifelong and stigmatised condition, but for every person that would have become HIV positive without PrEP, NHS Scotland will save £360,000 in lifetime treatment costs. We've also been bold in the many different measures the Scottish Government has taken to change our cultural attitudes to tobacco and alcohol. One of the questions posed to us at committee was, why is there a reluctance to use the most cost-effective forms of prevention, the most likely to reduce health inequalities? Measures that use fiscal and regulatory or legislative levers to encourage behaviour change, such as minimum, using price, minimum unit pricing or tobacco taxation, are very cost effective. But politicians do tend to favour less effective methods, perhaps because of the huge pressure from multinational companies, which the, the less effective methods increase inequalities, such as individual behaviour change or education and lifestyle, and they should only ever be a small part of a comprehensive approach. In Scotland, we have taken a comprehensive and bold approach in alcohol and smoking. And I would say that we need to take the same comprehensive approach to obesity and tackle the quality of food that we eat. We live in an obesogenic environment and we need to make it easy for people to do the right thing. And in my opinion, this will include using fiscal, regulatory and legislative levers to change culture. I want to finish my contribution by men mentioning welfare reform, as others have. An inquiry by the UN into the actions of the last government, which was a Conservative Lib Dem coalition, found that their austerity policies amounted to systematic violations of the rights of people with disability. And with this Conservative government, it continues. Disabled people losing motability cars means that they cannot work. The introduction of universal credit in the Highlands has caused severe hardship because of the delays in processing applications. And just in the last couple of weeks, the introduction of the two-child two cap for families claiming tax credits. Why on earth a child with more than one brother or sister is less deserving of state support, I cannot comprehend. The callousness of the rape clause. I'll finish with a quote not from me, but from the BMA submission. Inequalities have remained persistent and cuts to welfare support in particular have undermined progress that might otherwise have been made in this area. We do still have some time in hand. Uh, I call Jeremy Balfour to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you, uh, Deputy President Officer. And can I uh, thank the uh, committee for the work they have put in in regard to preparing this report and welcome the debate uh, today uh, where we can air a, a number of different issues. As uh, my colleague has already said, early years invention, uh, intervention is perhaps the most significant area where we can help individuals and society. If we can intervene to help young children and their families live a healthy lifestyle, then we are more likely to have less health implications later on. Good habits picked up in early life doesn't impact reducing the future of ill health to the NHS, loss of economic output, and can reduce the chances of risking individuals coming part of crime, prison, and all the associated costs with that. It can impact on the quality of learning and the type of life an individual has. 
Uh, I'm aware, as a local councillor here in Edinburgh, that within three or four miles of my ward, the life expectancy will be five or ten years less. That seems unacceptable to me in uh, Scotland today. We need to work with all areas of society, but we need to focus where we put the money and the resources to help the most vulnerable. Nobel Prize winning economist James Heckman, who, was, who argued that the returns for investments made in early years greatly outweigh those made in any stage of education. He says optimal investment strategy is to invest less in the old and more in the young. I think that is a challenge we face today. And when we talk about the young, we're not talking about those in nursery or in school. We're talking about from zero to three, year, three years old. It's helping families set patterns at the earliest stage that will give us the biggest improvement. Uh, certainly. Marie Todd. I thank the member for taking the intervention. I would ask the member again to reflect on how his current theme on, on supporting the youngest of children might fit with the, the policy from the Conservative government in Westminster of not providing tax credits for more than two children in one family. Well, Jeremy Valley, Balfour. What we're looking at here is, uh, yes, we're looking at how we can help uh, families generally, but we're also looking at how government both nationally, uh, UK and here in Scotland, and actually I'm going to come on to a moment in local authorities, can direct that help to help individuals. And, and we, and the government, and, and this country has made a decision that we should um, put that limit on, and I think it's a very sensible uh, measure. I wonder if I uh, can move on. Um, I, I had this morning uh, the privilege of, of visiting uh, Dr Bell's family centre here in Leith. Dr Bell's Family Centre has been going for many years here in Edinburgh, helping children living in Leith and North Edinburgh, where they can get encouragement, support and advice in a very relaxed environment. It is there to support uh, and help vulnerable and disadvantaged people from different cultures within that area. One of the things that they provide is, is a drop-in centre for nurseries, 48% of those that go along to that have English as their second language. Now, sadly, Edinburgh City Council and SNP administration has cut the budget for that centre, and they are now affecting services that they can provide. Giving money to that type of centre, I think, would be much more advantage than a token baby box going off to well off families. What we, need, what we need is to put the money where it helps most. And that type of centre is providing that. So we need to help... Absolutely. Excuse me. Um, which person were you taking, Mr Balfour? I'll take both. Oh, well, we have plenty of time for that. Let's go for Aileen Campbell first. I guess, going back to the intervention made by Marie Todd, which I don't think the member properly articulated, I wonder how you can square the fact that he's criticising the baby box, which has given families and given all children the best start of life, with the policy of limiting tax credits to more than two children. Does he not see that those two uh, comments are contradictory and actually that he should take the opportunity to distance himself from the policies of his UK government? Jeremy Balfour. Uh, uh, thank you. I mean, I wonder whether the Minister would uh, accept that reducing the amount that's given to local authorities, particularly here in the capital city, is affecting the amount of money they can then give to third sectors who are doing the most benefit. And perhaps yeah. the Minister would like to reflect that perhaps if the government supported local uh, government better, we wouldn't have these issues. Um, I'm happy to take the second intervention as well. Stuart McMillan. Thank you very much, uh, President Officer, and thank you very much, uh, Mr Balfour, for taking the intervention. Uh, the question I was going to pose was posed by the Minister, but, your, but the response of Mr Balfour uh, also highlights further questions, one of which being, if Mr Balfour is so concerned about the level of money going to local authorities, 
What did Mr Balfour actually do to lobby his UK counterparts and the UK government to not cut the budget coming to this Scottish Parliament? Jeremy Balfour. I think Mr McMillan must be living in a slightly different world than I am because actually the money that we got from West Michigan was more than we were got get last year and it is a decision by this Scottish Government where to give the money that is a choice of this Parliament and this Government and we have given less to local government this year than we had in previous years. So I think the issue is not a Westminster issue, it's a Scottish Government, mm -hmm. Scottish Parliament uh, decision. Absolutely. If I can uh, conclude, because my time uh, has gone, Deputy Presiding Officer, just to re-emphasise the point that I'm making, that early intervention will help longer term in all areas, and we need to look at that very carefully. Thank you very much. Alex Cole-Hamilton, to be followed by Ivan McKee. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I'd like to start by expressing my thanks to my fellow members of the Health and Sport Committee for their work in this inquiry and indeed to the clerks and researchers who so ably served that committee in its work. In his foreword to the 2011 report in the, uh, the Commission on the Future of Public Services, Dr Campbell Christie said that experience tells us that all institutions resist change, especially radical change. However, the scale of challenges ahead are such that a comprehensive public service reform process must now be initiated involving all stakeholders. Whilst this insight was offered in respect of the macro institutions that make up our public sector, I'm sure if he thought about it, he would have ascribed it to this institution as well. For a great many years, uh, the idea of rhetoric um, and since the beginnings of devolution, we have seen each of us employ the language of prevention, but not necessarily the structural and financial investment and culture shift required to see upstream funding which uh, set about reducing negative social outcomes. That continues to evade us. And nowhere is the cost of that failure demand, as has been described by Campbell Christie, more evident than in the continuum that rep represents our health service. Now, it would be easy for me to spend the entirety of my time poking holes and pointing fingers at the failures in command and conduct of this administration's efforts in this area. However, I believe that one can only offer such criticism with any meaningful credibility if credit is also offered where it is due. And as presiding officer, as Marie T Todd has already uh, articulated, since we last met in this chamber, the Scottish Government, through SMC, have made the prophylactic HIV medication PrEP available on the NHS. This is a tremendous victory for campaigners and a welcome recognition by this Government that the problem of HIV is still growing. Serving as it does in many ways, like something of a vaccine, the widespread avail availability of PrEP will help to dramatically lower uh, infection rates in at-risk communities. Um, and also prevent future failure demands that, for the NHS in terms of the lifelong HIV medication that failure to prevent infection can lead to. Would that this foresight could be replicated across the board? Now, I talked earlier about our health service as a continuum, and like a river, it wants to exo exist in a state of flow. But upward pressures exist at every level in that continuum, which act to disrupt it, that state of flow. A shortage of GPs leads to conditions becoming more acute and diagnoses being delayed. A lack of appropriate social care provision can lead to patients, like my own constituent, who I've raised in this chamber many times, George Ballantyne languishing in hospitals for 150 nights or more after being declared fit to go home for want of provision. And bed blocking in turn sees the cancellation of elective surgery op surgical operations like that of Dr. Patrick Statham, the neuro consultant neurosurgeon at the Western General in Edinburgh. And in turn, we can see severe delays in discharge from A&E into the wider hospital due to there not being an available bed, something that is manifest in statistics we see every week in missed A&E waiting targets. Now, we mitigate these blockages through prevention at all stages of life and in all demographies and, uh, and communities of our society. We understand the keystones of prevention, but singularly, we fail to meet that understanding with preventative spending, particularly in addressing health inequalities that we've heard many times in this debate. I shall. John Mason. 
thank the, mem I thank the, the member for giving way. I, I just wonder how you could explain where the money is all coming from in this, because should we take money away from the hospitals to put it into preventative spending? Because presumably we can't spend the money on the hospitals and the preventative spending. Coming Alex to, Cole Hamilton. Absolutely. I am coming on to the ways in which we can recalibrate the front loading and pump priming of our health service to meet exactly that demand within existing resources. So, despite a measurable increase in drug related deaths and a causal spike in HIV infection in Glasgow, this SNP government has reduced funding to drug and alcohol partnerships by as much as a quarter, a, qu a cut which totals nearly £1.3 million a year in our nation's capital. And despite the the Cabinet Secretary's assurances, these cuts have not yet bitten, so we have not yet seen the impact on outcomes. In our elderly population, despite the excellent work resultant from the 2014 Falls Framework, which has done much to uh, reduce falls in care settings amongst our older population, this government has yet to act on the mandate it received from this chamber earlier this year to bring forward a comprehensive fall strategy to tackle what has become one of the biggest causes of anxiety for older people, and with good reason, given its demonstrable relationship in terms of protracted hospital stays and mortality. But as Monica Lennon said, it is in the challenge that our nation's mental health, particularly among children and young people, that this government has been arguably found the most wanting, with delays in waiting times that have spanned years and children in abject crisis being turned away from tier four beds due to lack of available staffing. Now, in her first speech to this parliament following the election, the First Minister was very gracious in citing my party as the catalyst for the appointment of Scotland's inaugural Men Minister for Mental Health. Now, I do not doubt the integrity with which Maureen Watt seeks to discharge her brief and the revelation that despite a protracted dis delay, the nascent mental health strategy would span 10 years was gr greeted with great approval from the sector. But such fanfare was, however, short-lived. With such targeted and stretching aims and as I quote support for an increase in support for the mental health of young offenders and yet a further delay of our expired suicide strategy we might start to doubt the reach of this government's ambition in mental health and many do with professional bodies greeting the new strategy with dismay citing it as unambitious under-resourced and profoundly lacking in detail. There can be no greater frontier for us as a legislative body to push forward in the healthcare arena and in the preventative agenda than in mental health. Because with suicide is the, the, suicide is the principal cause of death in men under the age of 50. With over 600,000 days lost to the workplace due to mental health each year, and most crucially for that interruption in flow in the continuum of the, the health sector, that one quarter of all patients who present to appointments in GP surgeries around Scotland do so with an underlying mental health condition. Presiding officer, the stewardship of the health of our nation must not be measured by the treatment or absence of symptoms, but what we do as a parliament to keep people well in mind and in body, to stabilise chaotic lifestyles, to reduce health inequalities, to protect vulnerable communities. Only then can we possibly hope to meet the challenge before us. Thank you. I have Ivan McKee to be followed by Alison Harris. Uh, thank you, <clears throat> presiding officer. I'm glad to have the um, <clears throat> opportunity to speak today on preventative spend and the Health and Sport Committee's inquiry into this important subject. This debate allows members to make inputs into the committee's work, and I hope many will take that opportunity. And there are three specific areas I intend to focus on this afternoon. Firstly, the scale of the task before us. We will not provide a modern, fit-for-purpose health service for the 21st century by continuing to do things as we've always done them. The need for change is compelling. Secondly, the solutions that are available to us, in particular drawn on the work of the Christie Commission, which has been mentioned several times already in the debate. And thirdly, the imperative to shift the political discourse from the language of inputs to the language of results and outcomes. Health services across the UK and across the developed world are facing unprecedented challenges. Indeed, advances in health provision have been the uh, victim of their own success. An ageing population and technological advances in new medicines and equipment means that health inflation, the cost of just standing still, is running well in advance of general inflation. Estimates range from 4.5% upwards. 
And let me put those numbers into context. The Scottish Government is committed to a health service spend of £500 million over and above inflation for the lifetime of this Parliament, more than that committed by any other party. However, it represents an above inflation increase of less than 1% a year on the £13 billion annual health budget, around one third of the increase necessary to match health sector inflation. And it's an easy soundbite to call for tax increases to fund this, but even easier to see that this isn't a sustainable solution. The sums just don't add up. Matching health inflation of 4.5% for just 10 years would require an annual spend increase of more than £3 billion above inflation by year 10, the equivalent of increasing basic income tax by 7%. And this isn't a particularly Scottish problem. All health services face this challenge. The English NHS has gone down the route of increasing privatisation, privatising more than 7% of its services, 10 times the level in Scotland, and is delivering poorer services, a gap of more than 10% in any waiting times compared to Scotland. And these challenges are real, but the direction of the solution is also clear, and it isn't cuts to services and it isn't privatisation. The Christie Commission report of 2011 identified four principles to underpin reform of public services. Firstly, the integration of service provision, reducing silo working, and the integration of health and social care is a good example of this. Secondly, empowering individuals and communities and the Scottish Government's Community Empowerment Bill is a welcome move in this direction. Thirdly, the need for public service to become more efficient through technology or the adoption of operational best practice. Christie calls for delivering more with less. And the need for prioritisation of spending, which prevents negative outcomes. Christie went as far as stating that 40% of public sector spend was due to fixing problems that could have been prevented by more focus on preventative spend. This is a significant number some five billion across the health service alone. And while it may be ambitious, it gives us a view of the size of the prize. A country the size of Scotland is well placed to deliver on the Christie agenda, big enough to support a full range of specialist and high technology services, yet small enough to ensure rapid development of best practice. We must also recognise that technology is a double-edged sword. Better medicines and equipment cost, but they also enable efficient solutions in meeting the challenge be that through the use of advanced communications, remote diagnosis, IT or advances in operational management processes. These must be embraced. It's also important to recognise that not all preventative spend actions are effective. A robust process for data-driven evaluation of preventative spend proposals is necessary, taking into account upfront spend and projected time phase cost savings calculated on a net present value basis. And I make no apologies for the use of accountancy language in this debate because to be effective, the preventative agenda needs to be constantly evaluated in terms of return on investment. And here we encounter another problem. The data is not as good as it needs to be. In general, there's a surprising shortage of data-driven policy proposals. And I would take this opportunity to urge third sector organisations not just to produce policy wish lists, but to focus on generating fully costed preventative proposals which deliver measurable results. We should also recognise that while some preventative spend decisions cost money, others, often the most effective, consider smoking or drink driving legislation, are free. Decisions on health promotion legislation also needs to take into account savings accruing to the public purse flowing from improved health outcomes. And finally, we need to challenge to change the political discourse, a much needed move away from a focus on inputs towards a focus on outcomes. It's often easy for politicians to announce extra spend on public services, but outcomes are what matter to service users. The preventative agenda has as its core the concept that we can do more with less, that the relationship between inputs and outcomes is not linear, otherwise this discourse is pointless. A continued political focus on inputs serves neither service users nor taxpayers. This will not be an easy transition for us as politicians to make, but it is one we must. Presiding officer, I hope in my remarks to have outlined the scale of the challenge before us and offered some pointers to the way forward. The preventative agenda offers much to, the, to be positive about in improving outcomes and in managing cost challenges. We need to embrace this agenda with some urgency. Thank you very much, Mr. McKeer. Call Alison Harris to be followed by Richard Lockhead. Mr. Lockhead is the last speaker in the open debate. There is time in hand, so. Thank you. Deputy Presiding Officer. Problems caused by the abuse of alcohol, tobacco and drugs are major concerns for public health in Scotland. And ways to prevent or even reduce that will, in, will impact will have very substantial benefits, 
not only for the individuals affected, but society in general. All three can lead to a variety of social problems, including family tensions, antisocial behaviour, absenteeism from work and financial difficulties. But today, it is mainly the impact that they have on health and well-being that I wish to speak on. Over 60 medical conditions are linked to alcohol use alone. Alcohol is classified by the International Agency for Research on Cancer as a Group 1 carcinogen, the same grouping as tobacco and asbestos. Around 4% of all cancers diagnosed in the UK are caused by alcohol. For cancers of the mouth and throat, it is the second biggest risk factor after smoking. Alcohol is often a factor in coronary heart disease and is a commonly seen factor in the development of anxiety, depression and other mental health issues. Not only can excess alcohol lead to damage to essential organs such as the pancreas, it also has an adverse effect on fertility. Alcohol-related brain damage is another reason why the issues of overindulgence need to be tackled head on. It is estimated that at peak times, 70% of admissions to hospital acts in emergency are alcohol-related. It contributes to over a thousand suicides a year and almost half of violent crimes are committed by people believed to be under the influence of alcohol. Over 50% of all domestic violence incidents are in the UK are carried out by people who have been drinking. Deputy Presiding Officer, very often dependence on drugs, alcohol and tobacco is highest among those who already have health issues through poor diet and lifestyle. They are major contributors to health inequalities in Scotland. The Scottish Health Survey in 2015 found that alcohol-related mortality is not evenly distributed throughout the population, but is highest amongst those living in the most deprived areas, and there is a clear correlation between levels of deprivation and the rate of alcohol-related admissions. Worryingly, the misuse of alcohol and the start of potential associated health problems can begin at an early age. The trend for people to drink more at home rather than in pubs introduces children to alcohol, although often in a responsible way, but sadly not always. Youth culture too often links alcohol with having a good time. Getting drunk is now far too often the desired effect of an evening out. It is clear that work needs to be done with this age group to counter the alcohol industry's promotion of alcohol to the youth market. Yes. Thank Stuart you. McMillan. Prevention. Um, to be on that last point regarding working with younger people, but, but Alison Hallis agree that this is, this is not a new issue. This has been an issue that's been there for some time. It's been there for decades. And it is a difficult, it's a difficult nut to crack, and I think we would all accept that. But uh, I think Alison Harris should sit and generally recognise it's not a, a new issue. And I think all parties, and all, uh, all parties of whichever hue, should certainly attempt to work to try to get successful solutions in this particular area. Alison Harris. Well, I would like to thank Stuart McMillan for his question. And yes, I don't think it is a new issue. It is a very long-standing issue. I think it is an issue, unfortunately, that is getting worse in society nowadays. And it is causing more and more problems, sadly, to those that sometimes, you know, are, well, are not so well off in society. But I do think it's very important, as you say, we should all work together with a view to going forward and trying to sort this out once and for all. So, as I was saying, with regard to youth culture, perhaps in a way of actually trying to help the youth understand what's happening would be through the wider circulation of the excellent leaflet produced by Alcohol Focus Scotland and the NHS Alcohol and Healthy Living, which warns of the dangers caused by drinking alcohol in excess of the sensible drinking guidelines. The harmful effects of smoking are even better known than those of alcohol, and thankfully over the years the number of smokers have steadily declined to around 20% of the adult population. And the ambition of a tobacco-free Scotland by 2034 is very much a work in progress. 34% of adults in the most deprived areas of Scotland still smoke, compared to 9% of those in the least deprived areas. 29.3% of pregnant women in the most deprived areas are smokers at the time of their first antenatal appointment, compared to 45 in the least deprived areas. A child born in a more socially deprived area of Scotland is 
much more likely to be growing, uh, is thus much more likely to be growing up around smokers. And figures show that children born into a family that smoke are far more likely to become smokers themselves and so just repeat the cycle. A cycle that imposes on our poorest citizens the financial burden of smoking as well as the health issues. NHS Scotland advise that smokers from deprived areas get less encouragement and social support to quit smoking. And I'm sorry, can I just keep going for a minute, please? And are less likely to be aware of the harm of smoking and of secondhand smoke and are more likely to be heavy smokers, thus having a stronger nicotine dependence. In my remaining time, I would like to touch upon another aspect of the preventable damage that drugs can cause. My colleague Douglas Ross has today highlighted that the number of people on drugs drive dying at the wheel is now the same as the number of fatalities who test positive for alcohol, whilst the powers available to the police and courts in dealing with the drug drivers is far less clear than for dealing with drink driving. Drugs, drink and tobacco can shatter lives, break up families and cause untold health problems, many of which lead to premature death. Sadly, the burden of misery caused by them falls heaviest on the poorest in our society. The need to improve public health is one that we all agree must be addressed and I recognise the importance of the work being carried out by the Health and Support uh, Sport Committee on the wider preventative health agenda. And I thank Neil Findlay for his motion this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Harris. I apologise for the minute clock stopping, but I'll be restarting now for the next speaker. I call Richard Lockhead, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. That's a relief for your comment there. <clears throat> In terms of uh, this debate, I suspect that the spotlight that was shone upon it is not quite as bright as what may have been otherwise the case had not announcements uh, not been made elsewhere in the UK today. But I expect the general election, if it goes ahead as we all expect, uh, will feature many of the preventative measures that may be required to be addressed to tackle health inequalities and other social ills in this country. Uh, not least the fact that according to the Institute of Fiscal Studies, a three-child family will lose on average £2,500 per year, while families with four children or more will lose £7,000 per year, and four million families across the whole of the UK will see entitlements fall uh, as a result of UK welfare policies. So I guess the two issues in the news today, <laughs> hopefully this debate, but also the calling of our UK general election, uh, are very much interlinked. And I very much welcome this inquiry by the Health and Sport Committee. Of course, as many members have highlighted during their speeches, at the very crux of this debate is a dilemma. It is how can you feed the insatiable appetite of the NHS for more resources, as more drugs are developed, as people live longer, and so on, but at the same time, try and find the resources to address the preventative measures that we need in the first place to lessen the burden on the NHS. And that dilemma, I do believe is at the crux of this debate. I don't pretend to have the answers because we know that given the current financial climate, there's not a lot of spare resources out there, but it is something that politicians in this parliament and elsewhere have to wrestle with. We can't ignore it. And I hope the inquiry will hopefully find some solutions to that dilemma uh, as well. And also the fact that this is a multifaceted issue. There's no silver uh, bullet. Uh, it's such a complex issue and many members have addressed many of the different complexities during their speeches today. But I think what we can all agree on, hopefully, is that to address the issue of preventative measures being essential, that we do need bold uh, and ambitious interventions from governments. It is obviously easier for ministers often to stand up and deliver more resources to the NHS than deliver controversial measures which can come sometimes lead to difficult headlines in terms of some of the preventative measures that perhaps have to be taken in society. And as a member of the parliament back when we debated the smoking ban, I recall at a time how controversial that was and in many ways divisive. But of course, here we are in 2017 looking back and talking about how it's been such a successful policy. And as the health survey that was published last year showed, in terms of people who say they currently smoke, in 2003 it was 28% of the population, in 2015 it was 21%. Albeit smoking is still a big issue, it's responsible for 128,000 hospital emissions and 13,500 13, uh, smoking attributable deaths uh, as well. And as other members have also mentioned, lung cancer is expected to be the most common cancer uh, in the years 2023 onwards. I want to 
use the time available to touch on two issues uh, close to my heart today. One is food and the other is the need for more sports facilities in Scotland in terms of preventative measures. If we look at Cancer Research UK's uh, recent news release in September 2016, and they highlighted, again, as other members have mentioned, that obesity is the UK's second largest single preventable cause of cancer after smoking. And they said that junk food advertising and price promotions are amongst the issues which need to be tackled in terms of food. The charity called for junk food marketing to be restricted, along with price promotions and multi-buy offers on unhealthy food. And it then says, if left unchecked, obesity will lead to a rising tide in ill health, including cancers, and become a crippling burden on the NHS. And there's other statistics in here that we can't ignore, such as Scottish households spend more than any other UK nation on soft drinks at £2.60 per week, compared to the British average of £1.90. So I think there's a lot of difficult decisions and challenging decisions this Parliament, uh, hopefully with more powers in the future, over some of these issues will have to take. But I do welcome the fact that the Scottish Government are committed to a Good Food Nation Bill and the Scottish Food Co Coalition, of course, have been leading the campaign as to what should be included within that bill. They want a statement of food rights and responsibilities. They want to establish a principle of sustainable development, which ensures the needs of the present are met without compromising the needs of future generations. And they want to establish a statutory food commission with a civil society participation mechanism to promote involvement in policymaking, ensuring transparency and collaboration across government departments. So food and tackling some of the issues around Scotland's food culture is at the heart of preventative measures. And I'm delighted in this parliamentary term, we're going to debate what should be in that food bill and then take it forward. According to the Food Coalition, the legislation that needs to be addressed is the high levels of food insecurity and the reliance on food banks, low wages and insecure working conditions in many parts of the food industry, the ongoing challenge of diet-related illnesses, particularly diabetes, cancer and heart disease, and the impact of these illnesses on health inequalities including child attainment and quality of life, and of course other issues about the food system uh, and the global environmental crisis of climate change, biodiversity loss, uh, and so on. So there's plenty for us, forgive the pun, to get teeth into in terms of what should be in the food bill. All of it will be related to preventative measures, and there'll be tough debates and tough decisions to take. But I hope as a parliament, we're radical, we're bold, and we're very ambitious. The final thing I want to address is uh, the issue of sports facilities. The health survey I referred to earlier on, published in 2015, the Scottish Health Survey said that just under two thirds, 63% of adults in 2015, met the guideline for moderate or vigorous physical activity, a similar level to those seen since 2012. So not much progress. In 2015, just, just under three quarters, 73% of children met the guidelines on physical activity, a similar proportion to that seen in 2008, 71%, not much progress. And around two-thirds, 68 per cent of children, had participated in sport in the prior week, a similar level to that seen in 2014, but lower than 2008. And I turn to my own constituency, where at the moment we have the Murray Sports Foundation trying to raise the funds for a Murray Sports Centre. And they argue that in Scotland, average, there's one sports centre per 33,000 people. In Murray, there are none. Not one designated centre to develop sports for a population of over 95,500. And a Murray Council survey carried out in 2014 uh, found many worrying statistics in terms of access to sports provision uh, in the area. So in terms of preventative measures, I think as a parliament, as a government, we have to do a lot more to promote sports facilities. The Commonwealth Games have been and gone, and yet we have these statistics. At the moment, Sports uh, Scotland give grants, I understand, limited to £200,000. If a company wants to come to Scotland and invest in creating 30 jobs or 100 jobs, we offer millions of pounds. When it comes to building sports facilities to serve 95,500 people, the grants available are 200,000 pounds. This is not just an issue with the Scottish Government policy at the moment. This applies to previous historic policy, but it's something perhaps we have to grasp if we want to be serious about preventative measures and make it easier for people to live healthy lifestyles and access physical activity. So I urge ministers and all parliament and all parties to grasp some of these issues. We know there's a competition for limited resources, but we have to be radical, bold and innovative if we really want to take seriously the whole issue of preventative measures. And I do hope uh, Neil Finlay and his committee, and I congratulate him in his opening speech, uh, address some of these fundamental issues. 
to advise Parliament on how to move forward and give the people of Scotland a healthier, better quality of life. Thank you very much, Mr Lockhead. Before we move to closing speeches, I have noted that Monica Lennon, who took part in the debate, doesn't have the courtesy to hear her colleagues in summing up. She's obviously got better things to do with her time, no doubt. The front bench will advise her that this has been noted. I now call Anna Sarwar to close for Labour. Mr Sarwar, up to nine minutes, please. Uh, noted Deputy Presiding Officer, and I'll, I'll ignore what the Minister said uh, in my ear, uh, in, in jest, I hope. Um, uh, can I first of all start by agreeing with Richard Lockett? I think we do need to be bold and radical when it comes to preventative policy and when it comes to tackling inequality. I would like to believe that all of us would have been uh, excited by Scotland listening to a really important debate in Scotland today uh, in this Parliament about prevention rather than talk of another election but sadly for those of us who came into politics to talk about inequality we have to accept that perhaps today's debate is on the back burner while we talk about politics um, elsewhere. Can I start by thanking Neil Finlay uh, and all members of the Health and Sport Committee uh, for bringing forward this uh, inquiry. I know this inquiry will have support from members right across the chamber and indeed from all political parties and we look forward to hearing the final findings from uh, the inquiry and thank them for allowing the debate in this parliament today for all of us to contribute uh, to that process. Um, as Neil Finlay said in opening uh, this debate today, uh, this is an issue that cuts beyond just the health and social care portfolio. Um, it has relevance, yes, to health and social care policy, but also to um, inequalities. It has uh, relevance with housing, with welfare, with poverty, with education, uh, and so much more. So I hope this is a debate that is uh, listened to and indeed a report that's reflected on not just by uh, the Minister for Health and Social Care but actually ministers right across uh, the Scottish Government. Um, I think we have made good progress in Scotland around uh, preventative measures, I think around uh, behaviour and lifestyle. Uh, we have made progress, a good example being uh, the smoking ban um, which has been a transformative effect in Scotland and something that was replicated across the rest of the UK. I would, though, repeat what Emma Harper said, that that doesn't mean there's not still continued challenges, particularly around lung health, so there is more uh, that we can do uh, to, to take on the effects uh, of smoking. Uh, we made progress on alcohol, but we still have 12,800 cases of cancer related to alcohol across the UK uh, each year. Uh, we've seen the sugar tax, which has some impact uh, on fizzy drinks, but I do think we have an opportunity to tackle what I think is the next big public health campaign, which is around obesity and diet and that's why we look forward to seeing uh, the government strategy and we would we would encourage the government to make that a bold and radical strategy and if it is bold and radical they will have the full support of everyone on the Scottish Labour benches uh, and that obesity and diet strategy as set out by Cancer Research UK who have done so much work on this issue as well needs to look at a number of areas one around physical activity which I know is of uh, particular interest to other members uh, in this chamber but we also must look at price promotion particularly on junk food. We must look at advertising, uh, particularly on children's channels around junk food. We must look at portion sizes and also what more we can do about tackling high levels of sugar, not just in fizzy drinks, but actually in confectionery and other products too. I would note though Alec Cole Hamilton's uh, point around cuts to alcohol and drug uh, partnerships, which I think is a concern, and I would ask the government to please uh, reflect on that decision again. Um, I mentioned inequalities and I would say to members on the Conservative benches, to Donald Cameron, to Brian Whittle, uh, to Jeremy Balfour and to Alison Harris, um, I agree with Donald Cameron when he said that we need to be honest. But as part of that honesty, we also have to say that decisions that are made by government do impact on inequality and do have a negative impact on people's health uh, as well. And I think they must reflect on that in terms of decisions made by UK government, but also must say that Sc members of the Scottish Government benches must also reflect on decisions that are made by the Scottish Government and how they impact on inequality and what impact that has on health. Because the reality is in Scotland, health inequality is still uh, on the rise. Income inequality has got bigger, not smaller, uh, across Scotland and indeed across the UK. We do have tax powers in Scotland. We could choose to use those tax powers to have a more progressive taxation system, as was mentioned by Colin Smith, also by uh, Alison Johnson and touched upon by Marie Todd. We could use the levers that we have uh, in this parliament to actually tackle income inequality and help to drive resources towards the most deprived communities and help to lift uh, inequality. We still have a postcode lottery uh, in Scotland where your postcode determines not a child's 
life chances, but also a child's life expectancy as well. While that continues, that will continue to be a stain, I think, on our politics and our society. And we all must redouble our efforts to ch challenge the postcode lottery that exists. We've got to accept that child poverty, sadly, is also increasing in Scotland. We have the powers in this parliament, again, to tackle child poverty around education, around housing, around welfare, around health, around education, around the criminal justice system. And we should get on with using those powers so we can actually tackle child poverty here in, in Scotland. Um, and I should also touch upon fuel poverty. Although we've come out of winter and we're heading into the summer, there's no doubt that the quality of housing and the high levels of fuel poverty that still exist also impact on health outcomes um, as well and something that we have to really challenge. Uh, I want to repeat a point made by my colleague Monica Lennon, who I wish was in the chamber uh, today. Um, and also she's just come in. No doubt she's penning some excellent, apology e to excellent. me. Um, she has some apologising to do to the Deputy Presiding Officer. I'm sure um, she has heard that, and I'll pass that on for you again, Deputy Presiding Officer. But as Monica Lennon mentioned, as also did um, Alec Cole-Hamilton, the importance of mental health when it comes to inequality and prevention is so important. We have a generational opportunity. A generation ago, we didn't talk about mental health in parliaments. It wasn't even recognised as being equal to physical health. We are now changing that, but we still have work to do. So we should use the opportunity of being able to make a generational shift around putting school counsellors into our schools to make sure that we're supporting children who may later on in their life go on to have mental health issues. Quite often children have mental health issues at the most important times of their schooling time when they're going into exams and that issue with their mental health can impact their access to college, their access to university and indeed the access to the job market for the rest of their adult lives. So what we can do around mental health I think is an important issue. I want to just touch upon on two final issues which are around budget structures and then around workforce. Um, I think we all have the right intention in terms of challenging prevention, but we have to recognise that decisions that are made in here, but also decisions that are having to be made by health boards and integrated joint boards, can have a negative impact on patient care, on services, and indeed on the pressures that we see on staff. Uh, Ivan McKee touched upon uh, health board budgets uh, in his contribution. And the reality is the £1 billion pounds of cuts that health boards will have to make over the next four years will directly impact on services will directly impact on staff and will directly impact on patient care and undermine the preventative agenda that we all, I hope, are signed up to. As the RCN's briefing that was sent to us all for this debate also pointed out, the pressures that are on integrated joint boards has meant that they are using resources to cover other areas when indeed there are issues around recruiting community nurses who in many times actually lead the preventative work. So how we actually have the operation of the health boards, but also the IGBs and how they choose to use their budgets will again have a direct impact on how our healthcare professionals actually deliver prevention on the ground. Um, a specific issue in terms of uh, Glasgow was mentioned by Colin Smith and his contribution around welfare advice and benefits advice. We have a direct uh, in, in issue in Glasgow where £600,000 has been cut uh, by the Scottish Government for benefits support advice in the city of Glasgow, which again I think has a negative impact on income equality and then leads on to uh, other health issues as well. And I would ask the government again to please consider uh, that impact on the city uh, of Glasgow. And on community care, there is no doubt that the GP practice and community care is the entry point for the majority of people into our NHS. How we overcome the one in four practices reporting a vacancy, how we fill the, the, the vacancies that we have and the shortage we have with GPs, how we use the GP contract process to get more auxiliary support services into general practice, how we use the inverse care law, which was mentioned by Bob Doris, to actually give more support to the more struggling practices. Yes, there should be a universal um, access to a service, but we should also recognise if we believe in tackling inequality, that there are some areas and some practices that will require additional resource and additional capacity to help challenge that inequality. And I think the inverse cares law uh, and Professor Graham Watt's work um, addresses that head on. I just want to end by saying this, Deputy Presiding Officer, I realise I'm um, short of time. Is I'm not sure. I've got loads of time. I'll keep going then, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, um, I, I don't think we, our generosity <laughs> in the Chamber extends to hearing you ad infinitum. Th thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. Uh, just, I'll, I'll just address one final issue then, which is around workforce. Um, again, the um, RCN and indeed other um, um, trade bodies and trade union bodies for the NHS workforce are addressing the fact that we don't have enough staff for them to do their jobs properly. One in three NHS staff saying there's not enough of them to do their jobs properly. Nine out of ten 
nurses saying that their work has increased uh, in terms of the, the pressures uh, that they face. And again, the vacancy rates have seen 2,500 nursing vacancies across the UK, 300% increase in long-term vacancies in our NHS. That all has a direct impact on the ability of existing staff to actually have the time to care for their patients. And I think we have to get a grip of the workforce crisis because that, again, has a direct impact on how we can deliver prevention um, on the ground. So in closing, I would hope we all have the right intention to close inequality and, pro and promote prevention right across uh, this chamber. But we must recognise that we have a duty, we have the powers in this parliament, we have the duties in this parliament to actually deliver on closing inequality and actually making that the difference. I think that should be the mission of this parliament, is tackling inequality head on, whether that be wealth inequality, income inequality, uh, child poverty, health inequality, because only by that collective working and using the powers of this place can we actually make sure that every child, no matter where they are born, no matter their social status, no matter their gender, is able to maximise their life opportunities and maximise their life chances. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sarver. I have no doubt you could use the extra time. Um, <laughs> can I call now Miles Briggs, please, close to the Conservatives. I'll be equally generous with you, Mr. Briggs. Thank it's, you very much. That's a challenge the in the officer. light of Mr. Sarver. <laughs> I'm, I'm pleased to close today's debate on behalf of the Scottish Conservatives and I'd like, um, like many of others in the Chamber, to thank the many organisations that have provided briefings for today, the large number of which are a sign of a level of interest in the work of the Health and Sport Committee on the preventative health agenda. There have been some very good speeches from across the Chamber and consensus in a number of key areas and on key issues. As my colleagues have set out already in their contributions, the Scottish Conservatives are supportive of the principle of preventative spending and early interventions that can prevent negative health outcomes later in life. These investments in tackling the causes of ill health have the potential to save significant amounts of public spending over the long term and help reduce health inequalities. None of us in this chamber want to see our country continue to have such a bad reputation with health, having the widest mortality inequalities in Western Europe. Suicide is three times more likely amongst the poorer Scots. Cancer survival gaps of those living in the most and least deprived parts of Scotland haven't really closed. And stroke, stroke mortality rates is at the highest in some of our deprived communities. It's not a record or a reputation any of us in this chamber want to see our country have. And we recognize Two, that these challenges that face government as they seek to shift health spending away from care, uh, acute care towards preventative investment does, prevent many does present many challenges. I think Ivan McKee made some very important points to, during his contribution. While preventative spending should in time help reduce the, de the demand for acute services, there will clearly have to be a crossover period where full spending is required on both preventative and acute services, and that is a challenge for all politicians um, in this chamber. I agree with RCN Scotland, who have said we need to have a more informed public debate around the fact that spending on preventative health may, need, may mean <coughs> redistribution service redesign and investment in the benefits of primary uh, prevention, which may take many years to actually come to fruition and show uh, that these decisions taken actually can make a huge difference. My colleague Brian Whittle talked about diet and physical activity, and I want to back up the points he said on this. As a convener of the Parliament's cross-party group, or co-convener of the Parliament's cross-party group on cancer, I'm very much aware that more than 40% of cancer diag diagnosed are attributed to lifestyle and environmental factors, a point made um, by Cancer Research UK's excellent briefing ahead of today's debate. As Donald Canmoran said earlier, the cost of obesity in Scotland, the single biggest preventable cause of cancer after smoking, has now been estimated to add up to over 600 million a year, with wider economic costs of more than 4.5 billion pounds a year. One point which has been raised by a number of speakers today is a need for cross-portfolio working. And I think it's time that we as a parliament also reflect on this and how we can improve the workings both of parliament and the development of policy on a cross-portfolio and cross-committee um, basis. I still, as a relatively new MSP, don't see how we can influence the work of each other's committees 
good enough to be able to make that difference when it comes to policy development. And I think that's something as we look towards reforms of this parliament, I hope we will see um, taken forward. A focus on promoting exercise and a healthy balanced diet which avoid excessive calorie consumption is vital and perhaps the best example I've seen of an organisation outside of this parliament working on a cross portfolio uh, way is Jog Scotland. Jog Scotland has a major success so story to tell involving almost 40,000 Scots in hundreds of local groups across our country. And I share the concerns of many constituents who've contacted me about the Scottish Government's regrettable decision to stop funding this programme. I'm pleased to say that Sam H and Athletics Scotland have stepped into the void here to help secure the future for Jog Scotland, recognising the links between good mental and physical health. But it seems very wrong that a government that is reviewing the effectiveness of this policy that says that it wants to boost physical activity in the population looks to remove the support for a scheme that has successfully encouraged a cohort of inactive people to actually become active. Yes, certainly. Minister. I don't know whether the member didn't see the £2 million that we announced to go to our governing bodies, which will, of course, benefit uh, uh, Scottish athletics. But I wonder if he would join us in our calls to the UK government to work out how they improve the way in which national lottery uh, monies can be improved so that sport doesn't have to uh, feel the, the pinch on, on that and the management of the national lottery from the UK government. Well, as is always in the case of this government, the devil is always in the detail. So I'm delighted if the minister would like to have another intervention to confirm if any of that money is for Jog Scotland. Minister. Minister. Money to uh, Sports Scotland? Scotland for the governing bodies to make sure that they can uh, continue with the programmes that are increasing participation, which will include, of course, uh, looking at uh, Jog Scotland. Mr. Briggs. Uh, there's two words missing from that. I think it was Jog Scotland, but maybe the Minister would write, look to write to all of us to actually outline whether or not this is filling the cuts which the government put in place to Jog Scotland's funding. Anyway, I'd like to make some, some progress on this. Um, it's also helped, the work of Jog Scotland's also helped to reduce health inequalities by encouraging more women to participate in physical activity. Other colleagues, um, including Alex Cole Hamilton and Alison Harris, have talked about their real concerns about the reductions in funding and both alcohol and drug partnerships. And I agree that the government needs to also look at this area. For too long, I think drug and alcohol partnerships have been the Cinderella service. And I have my own real concerns in Edinburgh at how we are developing our um, drug and alcohol partnerships, where they will actually be placed within the health service. As in some cases, even they don't know where in the future they will be. And that's something they need to plan for better services um, certainly needs to be addressed um, as soon as possible. I wanted to use um, the time I had today to talk about preventative health in terms of mental health. And I've emphasized before in this chamber the importance of building resilience in our young people and the vital role that youth organizations like to, um, if I've got extra time, yep, thanks. Marie Todd. Thank you for taking the intervention. As you know, um, Miles Briggs, I worked in mental health for 20 years and um, in the time that I worked in mental health, the most significant impact I saw on the health of the people that I worked with was the welfare reform brought in by your government, by the Tory Lib Dem coalition between 2010 and 2015. I saw people made significantly insecure in their situation, tipped into poverty and um, frankly made sick by the treatment of the government. Will you be addressing that when you're talking about mental health? <laughs> Mr well, Briggs. In terms of the powers which we have coming to this parliament, I don't know from anything which I've heard from Mary Todd here on the health committee what plans her government are bringing forward in this area. There doesn't seem to be any thought going on in this area at all. But as I was saying, I've emphasised before the importance of building resilience in our young people and the vital role that youth organisations like Scouts and Guides play in helping our young people to develop the life skills that can prepare them for difficulties later in life. Support for youth organisations is essential and we want to ensure that every school pupil has access to these groups and all parents are provided with a list of these local groups in their area. Early intervention in terms of providing swift access to support, counselling, psychological and talking therapies for people with minor health, 
mental health problems is essential too if we are to stop less serious conditions developing into more severe ones. That is why I have consistently been calling for more action to reduce waiting times for psychological therapy treatments, something that remains a big concern for many constituents I represent trying to access these services in NHS Lothian. And I think looking back on 10 years of an SNP government, Marie Todd would maybe like to consider why is it that my constituents here in Lothian take two years in some cases to be seen by a specialist and for children up to a year. That is this government's record and something which I think they should start to look at in more detail. To conclude, Deputy Presiding Officer, today's debate is welcome and has been largely constructive. The challenge will be to take forward the consensus, which I do actually think does exist around preventative health policy, and to see the goodwill implemented in practice through policies that cut across government departments at all levels. As the BMA has rightly said ahead of this debate, public health interventions are more likely to have an impact when they are long-term and substantive. I urge Scottish Government Ministers to work closely with this Health and Sport Committee as we continue our inquiry into preventative health and to listen to our committee's findings as the Government and Parliament take forward policy developments in this area. Thank you. My colleague Aileen Campbell to close for the Government. Minister, um, up to 11 minutes please, if you wish. Oh gosh, right. Thank you very much, uh, <laughs> Presiding Officer. That, I, didn't I... Sound, that didn't sound as if you were very keen. <laughs> I'm sure you are. Oh, I'm delighted. I'm delighted. Thank you very much for the additional time. Um, I commend, like others, the Health and Sport Committee for today's debate, and I welcome what has been a very mature and considered uh, range of contributions from members across the political divide, as we all seek to create the fairer and healthier country that we seek. A tone very much set, I think, by the convener of the committee, and while I know he and the committee will seek to scrutinise uh, government as he is right to do, I look forward sincerely to the committee's report and working with the committee as they prepare uh, their recommendations and findings. Now, we all understand the challenges that uh, Scotland faces. Many members have articulated them today. We have an ageing population, a country that continues to have an unhealthy relationship with alcohol, a population where it's now more common to be overweight than not, and a country that needs to increase its activity levels. And what exacerbates and magnifies all of these are deep, unfair and persistent inequalities that are driven in part by the harsh consequences of austerity and welfare reforms. And where there is challenge, we must seek opportunity because we have enormous potential to transform Scotland's health and wellbeing, and there have been improvements. October's Scottish Schools Adolescent Lifestyle and Substance Use Survey showed that smoking, drinking, alcohol and drug use among young people are now amongst the lowest level recorded. And I hope that gives some comfort to uh, uh, Anne, uh, who made some contributions around uh, the uh, young people in her remarks. But we know that the pace of improvement is simply not quick enough. And in times of a challenging fiscal climate, the ability to simply plough plow more resource to fund increasing demand is not an option. Or as Donald Cameron put it, we perhaps need to challenge established orthodoxies and be frank and candid about how we marshal our public finances. Because the challenge of what the late Campbell Christie wrote in his report is still relevant now. We need to not only reform our services to cope with the fiscal climate, but also reform services so that they improve the quality of public services to better meet the needs of the people and the communities that they seek to support. We need to prioritise prevention, reduce duplication, and we must empower individuals and communities, trusting our communities to find their own solutions and just not be those passive recipients, very much in line with what the previous uh, CMO articulated, Harry Burns, and certainly very much in line with the current CMO's realistic medicine uh, agenda. And we must also again tackle those established orthodoxies as Neil Finlay, Bob Doris, Alison Johnson and Ivan McKee properly outlined by ensuring that the pre preventative health is not seen solely as the preserve of the NHS. This is about housing, it's about education, it's about justice, it's about environment and it's about transport and a whole host of other disciplines, professions and portfolios. It requires us to work together, and in a country of just five million, there is no excuse not to do so. Bob Doris, though, on a very local level, spoke with clear examples of how working together at that local level can also make real and transformative and tangible differences. It also, I think, requires us to be bold and innovative. 
because when we do all of those things, the, the progress and the improvement is tangible. And with regards to alcohol and tobacco, Scotland has frequently led the way. This Parliament passed legislation that would allow for minimum unit pricing for alcohol. The Scottish courts have found that lawful and it is with some regret that we must now go to the Supreme Court on a matter that would save lives. In the last three years, we could have seen over 200 fewer deaths and over 4,500 fewer hospital admissions. And I'll certainly be taking forward a refresh of our alcohol strategy and we'll be looking forward uh, to the uh, outcome from the Supreme Court. Similarly, our efforts on smoking have been bold and remarkable progress across different administrations has been made, illustrating again that when we take an ambitious Scottish approach, we can bring improvement. Moreover, our cancer screening programmes are among the best in the world. These programmes play an important role in prevention by detecting cancers at their earliest stages. And under our 100 million cancer strategy, we are investing up to 5 million to reduce inequalities and improve uptake, particularly amongst those less likely to participate in screening. And the important point others have made about obesity and cancer are well made and again will be very much in my mind as I bring forward our obesity strategy. And we're also seeing real progress and successes with our vaccination programmes and achieve some of the highest uptakes in Europe. Around 3 million vaccines are administered annually in Scotland, which helps to protect against a wide variety of disease. And these are hugely effective preventative programmes, second only to clean water and their value to disease prevention. And again, loosely related to that, I also echo the comments made by Marie Todd about the welcome progress on PrEP. And with my colleague Maureen Watt here, uh, collaboration and innovation has been the hallmark of the approach to our mental health strategy. Because we must treat mental health with the same priority and drive we give to physical well-being, intervening early to prevent issues developing whilst ensuring anyone uh, needs only ask once to get the help they need fast. And to support our strategy over the next five years, we have committed 35 million for 800 additional mental health workers in key settings. And in response to Monica Lennon, we've also an ongoing review of PSC and will investigate what evidence tells us works. Many members have also called on us to be innovative around what, with what I agree with Anna Sarwar is one of the most pressing public health challenges in Scotland, that is obesity. And again, uh, echoing uh, the comments made by a whole host of members on this topic, I sincerely look forward to engaging with all members on this as we bring forward the consultation, uh, looking to ensure that we can have that innovation that is needed to address this challenge that Scotland faces and the ongoing uh, health uh, challenges that that presents to our NHS. An issue that has also been discussed today and in this debate has been around uh, measurement, uh, strongly, very strongly articulated by Ivan McKee, and he is right about the need for robust data to guide uh, policy, particularly when there are uh, challenges around uh, public finances. We need to ensure that we can invest with confidence around what works. Uh, Moreover, though, we launched in September last year an independent review of health and social care targets and indicators chaired by Sir Harry Burns, and Sir Harry will offer an initial report uh, soon. His report will begin uh, to set out proposals that ensures our targets and indicators support our strategies for the improvement of health and social care outcomes, the future of the NHS and social care services, and support best use of public resources. That review has taken a whole system approach to measuring health and social care with prevention being a uh, part of the agenda focusing on upstream uh, determinants of well-being. Presiding officer, I wanted to touch on the contributions of both Alison Johnson and Marie uh, Todd, who powerfully articulated the damaging impact of welfare reforms. And I think illustrated uh, very starkly the cruelty of some of the measures by highlighting the limitation of tax credits to the first two children in a family and the absolute callousness of the rape clause. And I mention this because I find it absolutely astounding that some members in this debate have had what I think has been the audacity to criticise the baby box, which has the aim of giving all children the very best start in life and remain absolutely silent on the issue of the rape clause. I think it is uh, hypocritical and it's regrettable in what I think has been a very consensual debate that that has uh, not been uh, a two uh, areas of argument that they have not sought to reconcile. The Cabinet Secretary... Okay. Monica Lennon. 
would the minister agree with me that rather, I know I'm back, um, rather than not feeling very healthy in this debate, but would the minister agree with me that it's not a case that some people are choosing to remain silent on the rape clause, they actually support the cap on child tax credits and they, they, they support that a rape clause is a way to address that? And I had a lovely think... note of apology, <laughs> Minister. <laughs> And I'm pleased that Monica Lennon has managed to get back uh, to this debate because I think the point that she raises is a very important one indeed. That actually the, the, the issue of silence isn't because that they disagree. I think there are too many members who seem to uh, agree but don't have the courage of their convictions to simply come out and say it and at least be bold enough to uh, defend what I think is the indefensible. And I think uh, members across the, the chamber agree uh, with that. But we in this bench, these benches do disagree with the rape clause and to pay tribute to the work that uh, Alison Thulis in particular has done on highlighting this issue. Uh, and this is why the Cabinet Secretary has written to the UK government saying that we will not distribute Whitehall guidance as it stands to the Scottish NHS on this issue. Alison Johnston and Marie Todd are also right to talk about inequalities because imagine what we could do as a government if we didn't have to spend 100 million a year on welfare mitigation. But this government has also taken action on tackling inequalities with our Fairer Scotland Action Plan, setting out the things we need to do to make the changes that we need and decisive action to reduce poverty and child poverty, including massive investment in childcare in early years, delivering 50,000 affordable homes over the parliamentary term and free school meals to primaries one eight to three. So overall, uh, presiding officer, the health of Scotland is improving and we should celebrate the fact that people are living longer and healthier lives. But the benefits of these improvements are not felt equally. What is clear though during this debate is the ambition to do better. Our ambition is for a fair, smart, inclusive Scotland where everyone can feel at home and where there is genuine equality of opportunity for everyone. We must seek to use all the levers at our disposal to improve community health, social security, community empowerment, housing and education. They are interlinked and success is dependent on us working across the traditional boundaries. This is a complex area, but the prize of a healthier, fairer nation is worth working hard for. And on that basis, I look forward to uh, the conclusions of the committee and working with them on the aims and ambitions that I think we all uh, share. Thank you. Thank you very much. I call on Claire Hawkey to close for the Health and Sport Committee, if you can, till 4.59 <laughs> or thereabouts, Ms Hawkey. Speak I'll, slowly. <laughs> I will do my best, uh, presiding officer. And before I begin, I would like to refer members to my register of interests. Um, and uh, I want to thank you, presiding officer. And on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee, it is my pleasure to close this debate. This has been our first debate since the Easter recess. And it's refreshing to witness the benefit the holidays have had on some of the members across the chamber. Although with the news earlier today, some of us might feel much more weary than we did at nine o'clock this morning. Uh, we have had a thoughtful, helpful and informative debate during which, for the most part, there's been a most welcome outbreak of consensus. Members have spoken on a wide range of subjects during this afternoon's debate. Um, Donald Cameron made reference to the health inequalities between rich and poor in our society and how we need to work across the chamber to challenge this. Brian Whittle spoke about the importance of physical activity, a cause I know is very close to his heart, um, and it's, a, it's place in improving and maintaining health. Bob Doris spoke about housing, and housing that is fit for purpose, and its importance in the preventative agenda. Emma Harper, spoke about targeted interventions uh, that have already helped to improve health outcomes and to reduce mortality and about the importance of team working in achieving those goals. Alison Johnson spoke about the impact child poverty can have on health outcomes and the importance of income maximisation in tackling child poverty and the proven monetary benefits to families of these programmes. And she also spoke of the shameful two-child policy and the appalling impact this will have on children and on the income of some of our poorest and most vulnerable families. Marie Todd spoke about reactive versus preventative spend, in particular in relation to pharmacy and the prescription of medications, and the importance of education about the appropriate use 
of medications and also about the impact of welfare cuts on families and how this in turn can impact on health outcomes. Jeremy Balfour urged investing more in the young and particularly in the not to three year olds. Alex Cole Hamilton spoke about the importance of treating both mind and body. And Ivan McKee spoke about the need for change in health service delivery. And he also spoke about the need for a, a results and an outcome focus in the preventative agenda. Alison Harris spoke about drugs, alcohol and tobacco, and they're causing premature deaths, particularly in lower income families. And Richard Lockhead spoke of the importance of food and good quality food and of sporting facilities in preventing ill health. Yes, I will. Miles Briggs. Very grateful for the member for taking that intervention. I listened to what the minister had to say in her closing remarks, and she didn't actually talk about sport at all in how we actually try to address preventative health. Given the fact that funding for sports development in Scotland is likely to be cut by a fifth, which will see two million less for schools and PE and 1.5 million less for sports hubs. How does she think that will impact on actually trying to narrow the inequalities we see in sport across our country? Claire Hockey. Thank you, President. Well, I'm not the minister, so I can't answer for the minister. I'm here on behalf of the committee, as you know, Miles Briggs. Um, and when the committee asked for this debate to inform our work, we did so in the knowledge, as the convener Neil Finlay said in opening this debate, that it's a cross-cutting subject and it doesn't lie with a single committee, minister or department. The need for a preventative approach has been acknowledged from all sides of this chamber in this debate. And one key aspect of the need for a preventative approach lies in the persistence of significant inequalities in our country. The stubborn fact that a substantial proportion of the people in Scotland do not share fairly in the wealth and success of the country. People experiencing high levels of multiple deprivations experience a number of negative outcomes that are inextricably linked. They frequently live in families and communities where poor outcomes are mutually reinforcing, reflecting the significant spatial dimension to inequalities. Not my words, presiding officer, but those of the Christie Commission in their seminal report the Commission referred to by the Cabinet Secretary in her speech. That led to a clear conclusion that it is imperative that public services adopt a much more preventative approach, hence the health and sport inquiry. And we want to ascertain how much our health and sport services have moved into the preventative agenda in the last six years, what works and how it can be measured and crucially rolled out. But again, I remind members this is a cross-cutting issue which involves every committee. In health and sport, we scrutinise every activity and expenditure for the impact it has on health inequalities. We agreed as a committee to do that at our first meeting and it stands up front in our strategic plan. As members will know, I was and still am a mental health nurse and naturally I retain a keen interest in that area. Mental health was raised in numerous submissions to the committee, as it was today by Monica Lennon and by Alex Cole Hamilton and by others. Many observed it is frequently associated with health harming behaviours and long term conditions. And they suggested that by tackling mental health issues early, in or before adolescence, when they often first emerge, prevention of health harming behaviours is possible as well as providing a degree of resilience in coping with other long-term health conditions. I'm therefore pleased the new mental health strategy provides a renewed focus on mental health. The delivery of the strategy into practice is something the committee will be watching closely and not only for what it promises in preventative terms. We need to remember that many of the issues that cause poor mental health are to do with other social factors, income, housing and the environment people live in. Only through a range of approaches across portfolios can such factors be addressed. There are a number of support programmes being tried across the country and in the committee's work to date we've heard good, good reports from the Link Worker programme. We've heard about initial successes in the deep end practices and we're keen for the government rollout of Link Workers to be completed as soon as possible. We heard last month from Midlothian Integrated Joint Board about a similar type of support scheme, a wellbeing service 
which has been rolled out to eight GP practices. It sounds simple. It's about skilled workers working with individuals who are referred by their GP because they have underlying issues. It's about focusing on the outcomes the individual wants and helping them to make connections and use a range of different supports that enables them to take control of their lives. And we're told that initial evaluation results are looking positive. We've also heard about an organisation in Midlothian with a fantastic name, Pink Ladies First, which is in effect a self-help group where people use their own experience to support one another. In a similar supporting vein, I have previously mentioned in this chamber Family Nurse Partnerships as a preventative programme for vulnerable first-time mothers until their child reaches the age of two. This is another good example of spend intended to be preventative, which is being piloted, evaluated and is being rolled out across the country with the aim of improving pregnancy and early year outcomes. We have heard today calls for regulation. Submissions to us made the same point highlighting potential levies on soft drinks and the regulation of formula milk ad adverts, to name but two. We have also had comments around the responsibility of public bodies across the board to think system-wide, with a community focus in what they should stop doing and an approach which would be in tune with realistic medicine principles. The committee are grateful for the opportunity to involve all this, these issues and we are grateful for the contributions that have been made today and after today we will consider how best we can proceed with this inquiry and identify what we consider to be preventative spend and preventative expenditure, how it can be planned, funded and measured. We will grapple with counterfactuals, failure demand and false dichotomies and we will report our findings and suggestions to Parliament by the end of 2017. Yes, Mr Doris. Bob Doris. You mentioned uh, open to suggestions for things the committee might look at, and sport's been a theme that's come up quite often this afternoon. Mm. Quite often, sports investment via proceeds of crime or cash back for communities, there are whole pots of cash out there, not always at the Health and Sports Committee's uh, scrutiny. Um, I wonder if the committee would give consideration to how that money is directed at areas of deprivation and low physical activity, because actually I think maybe there has to be more of a targeted approach in relation to sporting opportunities in those areas. I can certainly think of local organisations in my area, and I'm sure the deputy even of the sport, Health and Sport Committee's area, that would definitely benefit from that. Claire Hawkey. I thank uh, Mr Doris for that intervention, and certainly I think he raises a very interesting point. I'm well aware of my own constituency of uh, some of the cashback initiatives and the positive impact that has had on particularly community sporting clubs. And I certainly think that uh, the, the committee would welcome the opportunity to, to look at that um, now that you've, you have raised that here in the chamber. And part of the reason that we were having this debate today was obviously to, to encourage debate uh, and uh, uh, sharing of ideas across the chamber from, from members of different committees who may not be able to uh, input directly into the Health and Sport Committee. So I thank Mr Doris for that intervention. Presiding officer, in closing, can I again thank all contributors today and thank our witnesses who have assisted us orally and with written submissions. I can, uh, can I thank our researchers for their support and most of all thank all of those who work in our health and social care services looking after our citizens of Scotland. We owe them a huge debt and the least we can do is to ensure that the policies we have identified and agreed upon are delivered quickly and fairly. And I commend this motion to the Chamber. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the Health and Sport Committee's inquiry into the preventative health agenda. It's now time to move on to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 5181 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a revised business programme. I would ask any member who wishes to speak against the motion to press their request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion 5181. Formally moved. Thank you. And no member has asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, the question is that motion number 5181 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. 
And there's a single question today, but we'll just wait for a few seconds to come to decision time. And the question today is that motion 4948 in the name of Neil Findlay on behalf of the Health and Sport Committee on its inquiry into the preventative health agenda be agreed. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are all agreed. And that concludes decision time. We'll now move on to members' business in the name of Christine Graham. And we'll just take a few moments for members to change seats.